WSFA 12 News and Fox 10 WALA bring you Alabama's District 2 Democratic Congressional Forum with candidates Napoleon Bracey, Marika Coleman, Anthony Daniels, and Shamari Figures. Tonight's forum is sponsored by All In Credit Union and Southern Cancer Center. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome in to the Davis Theater on the campus of Troy University, Montgomery. My name is Lenise Lagan, and I am from Fox 10 News in Mobile. And I'm Mark Bullock from WSFA 12 News in Montgomery. Parts of both of our cities and areas in between are part of this newly redrawn Congressional District 2. So our television stations are joining forces, if you will, to introduce you to the candidates that are running for that seat. And in the upcoming March 5th primary, voters are going to choose which candidates move on to the general election in November. So this forum is going to feature both Republican and Democratic candidates. Each will have 60 seconds to answer questions. And we're going to begin with some introductions. You can find more about these candidates and who they are. Our first candidate today is Napoleon Bracey. Thank you, and thank you all so much for hosting this event um, and making sure we have the opportunity to reach out and share who we are uh, to the constituents of this newly drawn con congressional district. Uh, my name is Napoleon Bracey, Jr., I'm currently a member of the Alabama House of Representatives. I'm the chairman of the Alabama House Legislative Black Caucus. I'm a former Pritchard City Council member where I served for six years, and I'm also in my fourth term currently in the Alabama House of Representatives. I'm 46 years old. I've been serving uh, for the last 20 years in an elected position representing people that live within this congressional district. Um, one of seven. Um, I have a beautiful wife, Melody, at home and three daughters. Definitely proud to be here. My family is from this district. Um, my parents are from Clark County, Alabama, and we're deeply rooted in this district, and we're proud to be here today. Thank you. Thank you. We have a number of current state legislators who are with us. We'll go next to Marika Coleman for her one-minute introduction. Well, also, I want to say thank you to the uh, organizers of this event. It gives us an opportunity to speak directly to the constituents that we're asking to vote for us. So again, I'm State Senator Marika Coleman. Have had the pleasure of serving in the Alabama legislature now for nearly 22 years. So. Of course, I have the most uh, legislative experience of anybody who is running right now. I am the proud mother of two young uh, adults who need me now more than they did when they were little kids. I'm also the daughter of a, uh, a real live American hero. I'm the daughter of a, a veteran, a disabled veteran. In addition to that, I'm a lawyer, um, I'm a community advocate, and I'm also a college professor. All of those things have prepared me to serve the constituents of Congressional District 2. I look forward to meeting more of you. And please go to my website at marikaforcongress.com to find out more about my platform and all that I've had to offer for these 22 years of service and what I want to bring to Congressional District 2. And welcome in, Mr. Anthony Daines, your introduction, introduction now. Thank you again for both stations for hosting this uh, forum uh, to give us an opportunity to speak to, directly to our constituents. I'm Anthony Daniels. I was raised in Union, Bullock County, Alabama, a small town called Midway, Alabama. Went to uh, Merritt Elementary School, graduated from Bullock County High School, and went on to Alabama A&M University where I received my degree in elementary education and a master's degree in special education. I was a classroom teacher, an elementary school teacher. I ended up becoming a development officer for Alabama a and I'm a model of Alabama A&M, and now serve in the Alabama House of Representatives. I'm also a small business owner. I'm a father, two daughters and a son. And my wife, uh, Dr. Tisha Daniel, and I own a small business in North Alabama. And so this, this, uh, this election is very important to me because I'm from the district. I'm um, from a rural community uh, where I was raised by my grandparents, and I have the fortune of, of representing an urban community, and I have a track record of getting things done in the Alabama legislature. And so thank you for having us today, and I look forward to continuing this um, debate. Thank you. Speaking of politics, our next candidate does have a familiar last name, Shamari Figures. Please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, guys, and thank you to all of the host organizations and uh, to each of the stations. Uh, my name is Shamari Figures. I'm the, the proud husband uh, to my wife of uh, five years, Kalisha Figures, and proud father to our three uh, young children. And 
I'm running for Congress because I believe that government can do good for people. And this is not a new belief. This is a belief that was instilled in me in my upbringing as a child, my parents, State Senator Vivian Davis figures, and my father, the late Senator Michael figures, and civil rights attorney. They instilled in us the value of giving back to the people and places who are responsible for making you who you are. And for me, that is Alabama. That has always been Alabama. These are the people that prepared me to go on and have a career in federal government service, working at the highest levels of federal government as an aide to President Barack Obama, as an advisor uh, to Attorney General Loretta Lynch, and most recently as Deputy Chief of Staff to Attorney General Merrick Garland. And I know how government works because I've worked in it at the highest levels of federal government, and I know how we can make it work for the people of this district. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Jeremy Gray, for being here. You can introduce yourself now. Uh, thank you. Um, happy Black History Month. Um, I'm State Representative Jeremy Gray. I represent Lee and Russell counties in the state legislature. Um, I have the honor of being the minority whip, a small business owner, and a founder of a community resource center that services all of East Alabama. I'm running because I'm a proud Alabamian and a resident of the second congressional district. I, under, I understand the diverse needs of the communities intimately, such as affordable health care, good paying jobs, safe and affordable housing, quality education, and clean air and water. I have the honor of being an effective lawmaker and a consensus builder in the state legislature. I passed six bills over the last five years with bipartisan support, something we desperately need in Washington. I've been on the front line of progress, and I'll do the same for you in Congress. I'm running because I believe the American dream is a promise and not a privilege. I'm State Representative Jeremy Gray, and I ask for your vote on March 5th. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gray. And we'll begin our questions with you, Ms. Coleman, sure. and we'll go around the, uh, the table in that direction. We'll start with a complaint we often hear about Congress, and that is, the gridlock in Washington, yes. D.C., the inability to get things done. If you were elected to d represent District 2, how would you navigate that gridlock, and would you be willing to work with the other side to pass legislation? Thank you. I currently serve in a super minority. Um, I started my career when I was in the super majority as a Democrat, now in the super minority. And even within that, I've been able to pass meaningful legislation including a bipartisan effort to remove the racist language from the Alabama State Constitution. So the proof is in the pudding. Throughout these years of my service, I've had to work across the aisle. And so in Washington, D, I, I really get upset at the gridlock. They act as if people don't like each other. In Alabama, we don't act that way in the Alabama legislature. So I'm going to take my bar bipartisan effort that I've used here in the state of Alabama, take that culture to Washington, D.C., and show them how it's done, how a Democrat can pass legislation even when you're in the minority. However, I'm anticipating that with this election and we take this seat, we will get the majority as Democrats and we we'll really will be able to pass le meaningful legislation that will help the citizens of Congressional District 2. Mr. Daniels, how would you address the uh, bickering, uh, per se, in uh, Congress and navigate your way around the gridlock to get work done? Well, my experience in the Alabama House of Representatives is uh, showing bipartisan effort. Uh, most of the bills that I've passed in the Alabama legislature have had 80 percent bipartisan support. Most recently, the legislation that I'm most proud of, uh, that we were able to get 100 unanimous support from the House and the Senate, is the elimination of the income tax on overtime pay. That gives hourly workers an opportunity to receive more of their money back in their pockets. I've also had experience working across the aisle uh, in the leadership role of making certain that we're setting the table for what goes to the Alabama House of Representatives and working out a deal with the other side on either watering down the piece of legislation or just flat out uh, negotiating uh, to remove the legislation off the actual calendar. And so I've had an experience in working across the aisle uh, in, 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 in a number of ways. And so as the House Minority Leader, it gives you the ability to negotiate uh, before things get to the House of Representative floor. And so I've also introduced legislation that uh, created the Cybersecurity and Engineering School, bipartisan piece of legislation. So my entire career has been a bi bi passing bipartisan pieces of legislation in the Alabama House of Representatives. Thank you. Mr. Figures, your thought on the gridlock we see in Washington, the inability to pass important legislation, and how you would go about navigating that? Yes, I've, um, I've had to navigate it personally. 
I spent several years actually working in Congress and, and working across the aisle and building relationships and building uh, a rapport with uh, staffers and members on both sides of the aisle. This is something that we have to do. Before I'm a Democrat, I'm an Alabamian. That is the priority. What does it take to do to get this um, district and get the resources home that we need to move this district forward on a variety of issues? And so it's not optional. We have to figure out a way to work through it. And I've been there. I've been in those rooms. I've been in those committee rooms. I've been in those staffing conferences, actually working across the aisle to actually get things done for the people of uh, the people across this country. Uh, the gridlock is, is, is certainly disheartening at times. But at the end of the day, my number one priority as a congressman would be to do whatever it takes to put the people and the communities of District 2 first and bring them home the resources we need to further the initiatives and the priorities of the people in this district. Thank you. Mr. Gray, if you're elected to represent District 2, how do you plan to work with the other side? Thank you. Like many of my colleagues, um, I've been able to work in a bipartisan way as well. Being minority, we'll, being able to whip up votes to figure out what votes we need to actually pass real important legislation. When we think about things like Innovate Alabama, we took a Republican on one side, we took a Democrat on the other side, and we passed two pieces of bipartisan legislation and it was good for the whole state of Alabama. It wasn't about D's and R's. It was about getting things done. It was about how do we get in front of the 21st century when it comes to innovation and technology. I want to take that same kind of mindset to Congress. And when we think about the 535 people there, we have to think about there's those people in the center that are trying to get things done. And I'm trying to work with those people to get things done across the aisle instead of trying to fight whether it was left or right be in the middle and just get those pieces of legislation that we know will be crucial for Alabama, especially District 2 done. So when you elect me, you elect someone who's a team player and that will work across the aisle. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bracey, your thoughts on this issue, how you would navigate gridlock, the inability for Congress to get a lot of legislation passed. Thank you. Um, I'm proud to say that I'm the only member of the Alabama House since 2010 that have actually chaired a committee. Um, I have chaired uh, the Mobile County Legislative Delegation with a Republican supermajority in the legislation and a Republican supermajority in Mobile County. So that's proven that I can work across the aisles to get things done. Uh, I believe that we need to look at issues as being local first. Uh, we need to make sure that we take care of home first, do what we need to do to take care of our district first. Last session, I had the opportunity to pass a bill that gave pay raises to all state employees. That was a bill that I sponsored, and it had 100% approval rating across the board, across the aisles, and it shows that we can work across the aisles to get things done. Uh, I believe that if you bring substance to the job and you work hard and be committed to it, then you can continue to get things done for your area and for your district and work across the aisles. Thank you. One of the major issues for voters is immigration. Uh, thousands of migrants have crossed the U.S.-Mexico border in the last year. Mr. Daniels, how would you rework the past failed immigration bill to get reforms passed? So what we had witnessed with the United States Senate, there was a bipartisan effort to address the immigration issue. However, the Republicans decided that they no longer wanted the issues, wanted to solve the problem the way this bill had intended to. Uh, and so what I intend to do is, is work uh, across the aisle um, to make certain that we are stopping the drugs that are coming over uh, that are imp uh, impacting the homeland. Uh, we had an example, an example in Selma, in Selma High School at one of the high schools in Selma, where a young person was a overdose off of fentanyl from a, a lollipop. And so we got to make certain that we're protecting our borders. Uh, we got to make certain there's a bipartisan manner. Uh, we have to increase the number of border patrol agents that we have. We have to make certain that we're adding more money on the administrative side to ensure that we're speeding up the process for those individuals that are trying to come into this country legally. Uh, and we have to make certain that we're uh, protecting the border and making certain that, that we're not allowing um, drugs or any, any type of things that are impact, negatively impacting us here at home. Thank you, sir. Mr. Figures, as you know, there was this bipartisan bill that offered immigration reform that was developed, again, by both parties, but yet Congress still was unable to pass it. How would you go about changing what was in that bill to make it more palatable to the Republicans? Well, I think there were some outside influences that, that really um, spearheaded a change of heart with Republicans, um, i.e. Uh, Donald Trump. 
listen, this is an issue that I, I've worked on personally. I've been to the border personally as a congressional staffer um, on multiple occasions to see firsthand what was happening on our border um, in Texas. Listen, the, the immigration system in the United States is broken. That's a, a fact that we acknowledge and something that we know that we need to repair. And we can do that. And we can secure the border while not sacrificing the foundational principles of what makes America, America. We are a nation of immigrants. We all come from immigrants. Uh, most, most Americans come from immigrants. Obviously, African Americans here um, come from a lineage of slavery, such as myself. Uh, my wife comes from a family of immigrants. My, my wife's parents immigrated here from Haiti. Um, and they made a life for themselves because they know the promise that America provided, and they did that for their families. So I do not like uh, the idea that our immigration system uh, should be focused on limiting pathways for people to come into this country legally, and I would do everything that I can to make sure that we're valuing the significant contributions that immigrants make to this country daily. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Gray, we're talking about securing the border. What would be your approach? Yeah, I will echo the same thing, that it was a bipartisan bill that i.e. Trump actually was the one that put it on the table. But when we look at uh, what we do as far as immigration, the security, we spend too much time on security, right? What about pathway programs that allows for immigrants to come over here as U.S. citizens so they can get a job and uplift our economy? When we think about farmers and skiers, if we were to do the right thing, they, we, they could flourish in America. Kids come over here and they can't get Medicaid, they can't get health care. By not allowing them to come over, they're going to come over anyway. By not allowing them to come over in a pathway that allows them to be citizens, we create more burden for the U.S. We have to pay for all these things. We can't. Our hospitals are overcrowded. We haven't expanded Medicaid in Alabama. We have so many problems. So creating a pathway program is really the thing that really will help us as Alabamians more instead of trying to keep them from coming across the border. And so I will fight to do that in Congress if you elect me. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Bracey, immigration reform, your thoughts on the recent legislation that was bipartisan and failed, and what you see as the path forward? I think the, the first thing that we have to look at is what's the motive behind the legislation? Um, I see so much legislation that's built by hate. And when I, when I say that is a lot of these bills are targeting only one specific group of people, and I think that's really an issue. Uh, I work in economic development and workforce development. That's my background. And I think we need to clearly define pathways to citizenships for people because so many people are waiting so long to have this pathway to citizenship. If we did that, we can close some of the workforce gaps and workforce shortages that we continue to have here. Uh, we have farmers that are looking for people that they cannot find. When HB 56 passed, um, the immigration law, the toughest immigration law in the nation here in the state of Alabama, the farmers suffered uh, because we don't create pathways to citizenship for people that would come out and do these jobs and actually work to earn a living. We're not talking about drug cartels. We're talking about people raising families, children in schools, and they want to earn a living here in America. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Coleman, we, we talked about the bipartisan effort to get some legislation in front of Congress, but it just was not able to pass. What would be your approach to addressing immigration? Thank you. So the question that you asked ori originally was, how would you change the legislation or make it more pal palatable for the Republicans? And I heard uh, the gentleman um, talk about a lot of aspirational things as it relates to immigration. But what I would do specifically is, work to actually separate some of the issues. One of the things that the, that the uh, Republicans got hung up on because of Donald Trump was also the funding that was in it for Israel and Ukraine. And so you may have to separate those things out and focus specifically on the border. We have a crisis at the border. Both Democrats and Republicans know that we do have a crisis at the border. The bipartisan piece of legislation was going to have additional funding for DHS, additional funding for border security. We're in Alabama. We're a border state. We needed that additional funding. But I'm going to appeal to people also. How do you make legislation happen? You have to get involved in the legislative process and make your legislators know I want you to support. So the people of, of Congressional District 2 needed to call uh, Katie Britt and also Tuberville to say that we wanted you to support that piece of legislation. 
We'll now move to our next topic, agriculture. It is the number one industry in Alabama. Farming is huge in District 2. Finding people to work on farms is somewhat difficult for our farmers. And there are ways the federal government can help support farmers. And we'll start with candidate Shamari Figures. What would you do to support farmers in Alabama at the federal level? So this, is, again, is an issue that I had the, uh, the fortune of, of, of working on um, as a staffer on Capitol Hill. The H-2A program is a, is a agricultural temporary work visa program that uh, hundreds of farmers across the state of Alabama take advantage of. Uh, in bringing in temporary immigrant labor uh, to work on the uh, to work uh, on the farms, and so I would certainly be supportive of that program. I would also be supportive of making sure uh, that we're prioritizing getting Americans ready and able uh, to take on the jobs that we have available here in the state. And where there's not a uh, a workforce that's willing to take on those jobs, then we can look uh, to alternative labor sources. But look. Agriculture industry as a, as a whole is, is significantly important here in the state of Alabama. Historically, uh, even when you look at our economic patterns and our migration patterns, progress in the state of Alabama has flown from our rural areas, and this district is majority rural. Uh, so as congressman, I would make sure that we're prioritizing our farmers, prioritizing our agricultural industry, prioritizing getting the provisions in the farm bill that I've worked on in the Senate in the past um, uh, made effective so that we can continue uh, to have a thriving agricultural industry here in the state of Alabama. Thank you. Mr. Gray, what would you do to support farmers? When I think about the surface water that covers Alabama, it's about 17%. Our neighboring states like Mississippi and Georgia, uh, Mississippi is at 60%, Georgia at 41%. When we think about the 5 million acres of farmland that we don't use um, in, in today's society, if we just took 2.5 million of those acres of land and we actually had a infrastructure for irrigation, it would produce more money than car manufacturing. And we're two or three in the world, right? And so we actually improve that infrastructure or irrigation. Uh, we would have so many jobs for crop, form, crop farming, rowing, and things of that nature where we could actually bring those jobs, higher paying jobs. When people have higher paying jobs, they come back to the rural areas. A lot of times people scatter because there are a lack of jobs and there's jobs in the more affluent areas. So if we're tapped into that untapped land and we actually help our farmers, we'll actually help the workforce industry. Mr. Bracey, what would you do if elected in Washington to support agriculture and Alabama farmers? Okay, I like to say that my family are proud farmers from Clark County. Uh, my grandfather, uh, Ecker Smith Sr., received the Negro Farmer of the Year Award uh, being a farmer. Farming gave my family an opportunity uh, to be successful and gave my grandfather an opportunity to be able to take care of his family. And that's one of the reasons why in the Alabama legislature I personally asked to serve on the Agriculture Commission Committee uh, so I can have the opportunity to serve in that. And it gave me an opportunity to see things like the Farm Act and see the type of support that's needed for the Farm Act to make sure that we can get this legislation passed to protect Alabama farmers, uh, just like my grandfather. Uh, we have to put things in place to protect this because, as you mentioned, this is the largest industry in the state of Alabama, and that's one of the reasons why I felt it important to serve on that committee in the legislature, and I formally said that I would ask to be on that committee uh, in Congress as well. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Coleman, your plan to help farmers increase their productivity. Thank you so much. It's, it's, it's a fortunate that my colleague's family was uh, farmers because my family were sharecroppers, right? They had to farm for someone else's land. Um, and, and as a result of that, of course, I understand the, rich, the richness of Congressional District 2 when it comes to farming. You know, farmers, of course, are, are the direct connection to the food that all of the families in Congressional District 2 will eat. Um, but so I want to make sure that the reauthorization of the Farm Bill actually happens. There is a continuing resolution right now that goes on to September, but we need that full reauthorization to make sure that our family farms in Congressional District 2 have access to USDA funding and other um, programs so the family farm can continue 
In addition to that, with the reauthorization, that also is the food programs for other families that are not farmers. The WIC program, me as a young mother, I had to actually partake in the Women in, in, in Infant and Children's program that also is a part of the Farm Act. So I would advocate in the uh, full reauthorization of the Farm Bill as your member of Congress. And finally, Mr. Daniels, your thoughts on agriculture, farming, and what Congress can do to support that industry. I agree with my colleagues. I'm a strong supporter of reauthorizing uh, reauthorizing the American Farm Bill. Uh, one of the things that we have to do, especially in Congressional District 2, is ensuring our crops. We have to make certain that farmers have access to credit. Uh, we have to make certain that families have an, the ability to have food on the table. Uh, and we have to make certain that we're listening to our farmers. Uh, oftentimes, family-owned farms are not necessarily getting the credits that they need uh, from us, and, and so focusing on family-owned farms right here within the 2nd Congressional District, but making certain that farmers have the ability to get their, their products to, to stores and direct sales. And so what we would do is looking at the, 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 the way we're exporting our, our goods in, within the 2nd Congressional District uh, in the state of Alabama as a whole, uh, of making certain that we are having things within that particular piece of legislation that addresses some of the concerns of the, the farmers that are in and future farmers that are in Congressional District 2. Thank you. Inflation, government spending, these are hot topics for voters. Both parties seem open to spending taxpayer dollars, not budgeted. Uh, our question now, Mr. Gray, what are your thoughts on this and how would you rein in government spending? Thank you. Like, like any business model, you want to, you know, you don't want to spend more than you make. But we understand that there are certain things like mental health, um, education, um, housing, there's many things that, that we need to address. And so that we need to de decrease the deficit um, that we have as a, as a country, we have to also understand that if we do that, we also may be hurting those that, the least of these, right? And so as, we, as a business model, we can look at it, how do we save over time, but not cut back the resources? Because there are many resources that many Americans need. And America is built up the American dream that anyone can come here and actually thrive and not survive. And so for me, it's really about looking at ways, steps over a course of time, how do we save, how we budget, and how do we decrease that deficit while not only uh, helping America, but also helping the people. Thank you. And now to Mr. Bracey, your thoughts on this issue. Uh, yes, I think that we have a responsibility of trying to live within our means and operating within our budgets. Um, I've had the experience over the last two years to serve on the General Fund Budget Committee, and I also serve as the Finance Committee Chairman for Alabama State University Board of Trustees, so I'm over the finances for the university, and it gives me an insight on budgeting and things that we need to do to kind of stay within those budgets. But I think we also need to look at the, the way people are price gouging people. Uh, we look at inflation and we start labeling these things, but so many people are charging people so much more than what things normally would have cost. And I think they are blaming this on inflation. They're saying that this is inflation that's driving up this cost. And I think people are just really being taken advantage of. Uh, it could be very simple things. They used to blame it on COVID, but now COVID is gone and these prices are continuing to rise. Wages are not rising and people just cannot afford the everyday necessities anymore. And Ms. Coleman, uh, speaking about inflation and government spending, how would you rein in spending? Yeah, so, you know, throughout um, the time that I've been running, I've gone to, I've, I've held listening sessions throughout Congressional District 2 and every portion of the counties. Um, in addition to, as I was talking to my cousin Reginald in Tomerville and my cousin Charlene in Mobile, just thinking about the challenges that they have. Where do we get this money for the human infrastructure that we need? At the federal level, I've been an advocate for many years, maybe 22 years in the legislature, with an organization where we're looking for nuclear disarmament and where we're really looking at cutting the nuclear budget from the year 2014 to 2023, $355 billion were spent on nuclear bombs that end up being um, buried in the ground. If we got just a portion of those dollars, we could use that funding for my cousins, Reginald, Charlene, and others who need health care, who need social security, who need education, who need infrastructure. If we cut a portion of that defense budget when it comes to 
nuclear weapons. That's where I would uh, shore up our federal budget to get this money for human infrastructure. And thank you. Now to Mr. Daniels, your thoughts about the inflation that Alabama families face and the exorbitant spending that happens in Washington. So our folks, our economy is growing uh, at a rapid pace. I know that there are anticipation a few years ago of fear about uh, our economy going to a recession. But we've seen our economy bounce back in record numbers. The anticipated report was about 2.7 million jobs that we're anticipating in 2023. Well, we ended up creating about 3.1 million jobs after the revisions. And so we're seeing our economy move in the right direction. As, re as it relates to defense spending, um, there's a plant, the Lockheed Martin plant down in Troy, Alabama, in Pike County, uh, where all of the missiles that, that we're, they're making there are being sent to um, uh, Ukraine. And so we got to make certain that uh, when we look at cuts and we look at spending cuts, we have to make certain that those spending cuts does not indirectly or directly impact the district that we're running in. Because military spending is important, uh, defense spending is important to this region. There's about five military bases within this particular district and, and a, lot, a number of jobs, 400 jobs just at the plant, Lockheed Martin plant um, in, in Pike County. And so we have to make certain that we're, we're paying close attention and monitoring the things that are happening that are directly and indirectly impacting the Congressional District 2. Thank you. Mr. Figures, your thoughts on inflation, the cost of living being so high, how would you address that in government spending? Thank you. The, um, we, we do have a responsibility as a federal government to make sure that we're doing everything that we can uh, to live within our means. However, this conversation is too oftentimes uh, focused on uh, cuts and the spending that uh, targets the most vulnerable people um, in this district and in this nation. Uh, poor people, our seniors. Uh, as, Congress, as a congressman for this district, I would never, uh, ever support uh, any cuts in spending to Social Security uh, or to the programs that so many people in this district rely on and are critical uh, to their ability to survive in this country. Um, we have to make sure, we have to make sure. I was down in, in Butler County last week and ran into a woman and the only thing she wanted to talk about was what are you going to do to make sure that our Social Security checks keep up, that they keep up with the cost of living as it goes up. And I made her that same commitment, uh, that I would do everything in my power to fight to make sure that the benefits and the rights that you have earned through your blood, sweat, hard work, and tears, and, 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 and contributions to this country's economy, that we do everything that we can to defend that for you. Thank you. We've already gotten to know you all in some ways, and we're gonna continue that process in just a couple of minutes. We're gonna take a short break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to this special candidate forum on WSFA 12 News in Montgomery and Fox 10 in Mobile. We are hearing from the candidates running in the upcoming March primary for Alabama's 2nd Congressional District. And for this portion of the broadcast, we're hearing from the Democrats. And now let's continue on with our line of questioning. Large amounts of federal money has been poured into the state to increase broadband in Alabama, still many areas don't have internet. Mr. Bracey, do you support this spending and do you feel more needs to be done to connect rural areas? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, we've seen this during COVID where broadband expansion is so necessary, where we've seen school buses parked in communities to try to create satellite uh, hotspots so children can be able to, to do their homework and get their education remotely. Companies are not going to locate to these communities if they can't have internet access, if they can't have good schools for their children to attend. And also, hospitals are not going to be able to function in these communities if they cannot have broadband access. This is so vital and so very important because all of our kids should have a fair opportunity for a quality edu education, quality employment, and should have the opportunity to be able to compete with other kids worldwide. And the way that happens is through the World Wide Web, and that's through broadband expansion. So I definitely support broadband expansion for these rural communities because they, those students in those communities deserve to have everything that everybody else has. Thank you. Thank you. 
Marika Coleman, we yes. all know broadband, high-speed internet access, if you will, has become an important part of our lives. Yeah. We've heard about grants that have come to Alabama that have started that expansion process, but there's much more to be done. What can be done on the federal level? Yeah, thank you so much. I had the opportunity, um, I serve as the chair of the Alabama Legislative Black Caucus, and I was invited uh, to the White House to talk specifically about Build Back Better um, and the amount of money, infrastructure money that had come to the state of Alabama. Of course, broadband was one of the issues. And one of the things that we have to make sure, though, is when we have this influx of money that comes into the state, that you have a leader that will make sure that the money and the that the money and the infrastructure itself goes to the areas that it needs to. There actually was a county commissioner there from Perry County who brought the point up to say, hey, we've got this money, but make sure it goes to the poor areas. It is a shame when um, students that are trying to compete globally. This is no longer of our students just competing with each other here in the state of Alabama, but nationally, they are, they are competing internationally, globally. They should not have to go to the McDonald's to be able to do homework. So I will make sure, as your member of Congress and Congressional District 2, that those lines are laid where they need to go. Even for personal reasons, my, my, my daughter and I have been driving up and down these highways, and, and if something happens, we need to make sure that we're able to call folks in the time of need, just like other people in Congressional District 2. Mr. Daniels, if you're elected to represent District 2, what would you do? What are your thoughts on spending in terms of connecting rural areas with broadband? Absolutely. We, we see that in 20, April 2024, a lot of the dollars for connectivity is, start, is slated to expire. And so for me, we will we'll, we'll work to, to ensure that communities like in Bullock County and Macon County and, and Monroe County and all those rural communities, the 11 out of 13 counties that are within the congressional, second congressional district and some of the areas that are uh, spots uh, within the urban areas in Mobile and Montgomery, uh, that communities that still don't have, uh, that, that are limited to their access as well. And so we have to make certain that we double our efforts to investment in uh, broadband across the, the entire congressional, second congressional district in all areas rural and urban areas uh, because what we're what families have been experiencing is the 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 inability to be able to have their children access their homework and, and access uh, their, their school activities virtually and so as, as my colleague mentioned some of the um, they had to drive a, a bus uh, to the McDonald's and have families park outside the McDonald's in order to have connectivity that is that is not right in our in our country and we we should do better we know better and we should do better and I'll make certain that the state of Alabama continue its investments and do what it said it was going to do in addressing the broadband issue as well. Thank you. Mr. Figures, what else needs to be done to connect parts of Alabama that remain unconnected? We have to prioritize ensuring that the funds get to where they need to go and that when we have state broad or broadband funding that comes to the state of Alabama, that it does not end up just providing internet access to a local hunting camp but rather it actually gets that last mile service connected to the homes that sit within the general radius of that same hunting camp. So we have to prioritize that from an oversight perspective and putting more restrictions on specific use of the funding that comes in uh, to support broadband expansion. Look, we, we, we know that there were significant educational drop-offs during COVID when students had to be educated in a remote environment. But there were far too many students in the state of Alabama that, that where that dynamic actually resulted in no education. No student, no child in the state of Alabama should have to go sit in the parking lot of a McDonald's or any other restaurant to be able to do their homework, to be able to access the internet. If we're trying to build an economy and, and a workforce that can support the jobs of the future, we have to be sure that we're doing everything that we can to equip and prepare our students and making sure that they have access to the resources that are necessary to be the solutions to those problems of the future and to be the workers for the future. Thank you. Mr. Gray, do you support broadband spending and what more do you feel needs to be done so that all areas have that connectivity? Yes, yeah, certainly I do. At first I want to just thank um, President Biden for the bipartisan infrastructure bill um, that brought so many funds down to Alabama. We understand that infrastructure, when it comes to broadband, it's a $6 billion uh, investment to actually connect the entire state of Alabama and when we think about 2020 at the height of COVID, it was so many disparities, whether it was education, healthcare, remote work, all those things, we, it was a shining a light on things that were already prevalent in our society, but broadband actually brought that out and COVID actually brought that out as well. And so really working with 
the president, working with uh, the Congress people to actually bring more funding down because $200 million is not enough, $400 million is not enough. That is chump change, of, you know, according to $6 billion being 47, 48 when it comes to connectivity, we need more funding and resources to come down to Alabama, and that's what I want to do as your congressman. Thank you. Our next question deals with the boundaries of District 2 itself. The law says you do not have to live in a congressional district that you are running in. Some candidates in District 2 don't live in this newly redrawn district. Mrs. Coleman, do you feel candidates should live in the district that they represent? And if elected, how would you engage with your constituents here? Sure, I think they actually should live when they are elected. Um, I'm one of the candidates not that has family roots in the district, but I did not live in the district when the district, um, uh, when we first got the district drawn. Matter of fact, nobody up here lived in the district uh, when the district was first drawn. But I do have a rental home here in Montgomery. And I think that it was important for me to come to be amongst these folks that I'm asking to, um, to vote for me. So sure, 100%, I think whoever wins this race needs to make sure that they live and that they are um, connected to the constituents and they stay accessible. But I also think the proof is in the pudding. You know, I've been a person that's been accessible to not only my current constituents, but I'm a person that has been asked to come speak all over the state of Alabama. And so again, yes, 100%, I think the person that once they're elected, if they have not already moved to the district, should live amongst the folks that they're asking to represent them, 100%. Mr. Daniel, your thoughts. Do you feel candidates should live in the district that they will represent? Yes, I think that their permanent residency, once they're elected, should be in the district. Uh, I know that as minority leader, I have the great fortune of being engaged uh, in, with my colleagues that currently live in the district and ensuring that projects are getting done within their district. But more importantly, I'm from the district. I was raised in Bullitt County, uh, went to Ele uh, Merritt Elementary School, graduated from Bullitt County High School. But even during that, even after uh, leaving and, and going to college and going on to work in D.C. and coming back to Alabama to work, I've stayed engaged in the district. Uh, I go to my family during Thanksgiving or during Christmas. I'm at my family's table uh, in Midway, Alabama. Uh, I'm engaged in sporting camps and other things there. Uh, I've partnered with the Department of Defense and brought back robotics camps to the kids in Bullitt County. Uh, I've helped with uh, sewer, uh, water and sewer projects all throughout the rural areas within the district. I work with the governor and the, and, and the bipartisan support on the Rebuild Alabama to ensure that roads and bridges are, 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 are prioritized in some of our rural communities and our urban communities within the district. And so whether you sleep, if you're sleeping in the district and you're not delivering more than those that are outside of the district, then does sleeping or does actually living in the district currently uh, have that much of an impact? People want to see results. Thank you, sir. Mr. Figures, we're talking about whether a candidate should live in the district that he or she represents and ways that you would engage with your constituents if elected to Congress. Absolutely. <clears throat> I agree with my colleagues that um, if elected, you should certainly uh, live in the district in which you're representing. Um, but I have a slight disagreement because I actually believe that you should live in the district in which you're asking people to vote for you. Uh, I believe that it's critical that you, that you live amongst, works among, work amongst, go to church amongst the people that you're actually asking to vote for you and at the time that you're asking them to vote for you. I think that's a reflection of the dedication and commitment that you actually have uh, to the people of that district. Uh, listen, I, um, I'm the only person on this stage who can say that they were born in this district, raised in this district, and currently live in this district. On election day, I will be able to vote for myself because I made the decision along with my wife and my family that when we ran for, to run for this seat, that we need to be here in this district and in this district now. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, it is about who can we trust to go to Washington, D.C. and get things done for us. And I think when you uh, bring candidates into a race uh, that are from other cities, you always have the risk of worrying about are they going to prioritize cities other than the cities in this district. And that is not an issue that you would have with me as your congressman. Thank you. Mr. Gray, do you feel candidates should live in the district they represent, and how would you connect or engage with your constituents? Yes, I think you should live in the district and you should have an investment in the district. So if you don't live in the district, you should move in the district, right? And so when we think about someone like me has been representing Russell County for the last six years, not only have I been serving Russell County, I also bearing resources to Russell County, I had football camps in Russell County, went to churches in Russell County in District 2, and so for me, it's really about having skin in the game. And so on March 5th, as well as tomorrow, I'll be able to vote for myself on March 5th as well. 
and I'll just ask for people to vote for me as well in District 2, because at the end of the day, when we have to think about how we're going to prioritize places in the district, if you're from the district, you've been bringing resources to the district, you're more likely to give to the district and, in, in, and not other places um, throughout the state of Alabama. And so for me, it's really about having skin in the game, having an investment, and you can't just start having an investment now. You have to do the work before you got here. And so that's what I plan to do. Thank you. Thank you. And the last word on this topic will come from Napoleon Bracey. Yes, uh, the Constitution is the Constitution. We can't change um, what it takes for a person to be able to run for this position. But I can say that for the last 20 years, I have been elected to represent the citizens that live within this district. My family is from Clark County, Alabama, that's within this district. They moved to the Happy Hills Projects in Mobile and then to Pritchard within this district. Every public school that I've ever attended is within this, di is within this district. When I left and went off to college, I immediately came back and started servicing, serving in this district. I have a business in this district on Dolphin Street in downtown Mobile. My wife, my wife and I both work in this district. I work in the shipyard. She's a nurse in a hospital. We attend church in this district, and we are of this district. So I think it's very important on the candidate that you will see at Walmart, you will see when you pick your kids up at school, you'll see at church, because I've been serving this district for the last 20 years. Thank you. And on to our next question, question number seven, a time for you to brag about your past experience briefly, 60 seconds reminder <laughs> for these questions. But how has your past experience prepared you for this job, Mr. Daniels? Absolutely, my past experience has prepared me for this job because as a legislator, I actually have a track record of delivering resources to the entire state of Alabama. Uh, passing the overtime bill to allow families, working families, to be able to receive more of their money back in their pockets. Creating the cybersecurity and engineering school, the only one of this kind in the state of Alabama where 26% of the students must be African must be African American or reflective of the population within the state of Alabama. Uh, being Having the ability to negotiate. There's a difference between working for a politician and being a politician. Being a politician and getting it done, uh, there's a different relationship. There's a different negotiation. Uh, there's a different opportunity for you to be able to give your word and, and being able to navigate and play 3D chess instead of checkers of delivering the resources to the district throughout the entire district. And so I have the fortune of serving on very important committees, budget committees, where I deliver a, a lot of resources to higher education institutions, uh, making sure that our, our infrastructure is strong, uh, as well as in our K-12 environment. And so making those investments in higher education uh, um, as well as a cradle to pre-K within the district. I have delivery, I have deliverables and receipts in this district of things that I've done, not things that I say I'm going to do. Mr. Figures, how has your past experience prepared you for a position in Congress? Congress is in Washington. It's not Montgomery. And Montgomery is not Washington. It's a different dynamic. It's different processes. It's different agencies. It's different resources. It's different relationships. It's different networks. Um, I've had the privilege to be able to work in Washington at the highest levels of government. I've had the privilege to be able to build relationships on Capitol Hill to the White House to agencies. I know how the federal government works. My past experience has literally been navigating the channels of federal government in all three branches of federal government. And as we go around this district and we talk to people, the main thing that we get from them, aside from them wanting to know where you live, is what can we know about you and your ability to actually get things done? And as the only person in this race who's actually ever worked a day in Washington, D.C., I bring that to the table. There are relationships that are already there. There are networks that are already there that I will be chomping at the bit to use to the benefit for the people and the places that matter most to me, which is the people of District 2 in this race. Thank you. Mr. Gray, what in your past experience has prepared you should you be elected? Thank you. No, we must have relationships. We have to understand we're a part of the legislative branch. And one of two of those things are passing legislation and bringing resources. And as a state representative over the last six years, I've passed numerous amounts of legislation, whether it was bringing innovation and tech jobs to Alabama, uh, protecting st uh, student athletes through the Terrell Spencer Act, or 180 day grace period bill that allows for returning citizens a fair shot at the second chance. Or whether it was repealing 
the 28 year ban on yoga for mental health. I've been at the front line of progress. And if you do this, if you pick me, and if I'm elected, I'll do the same thing in Congress. And so that is the experience, taking that, working across the aisle, that bipartisan support, that, that confidence of being able to pass legislation and bringing dollars to the community. There is no, no practice for that. You have to be in the game to actually win. And so that's what I plan to do when I go to Congress. Thank you. Mr. Bracey, talk about the experience you have that qualifies you for a seat in Congress. Thank you. Um, the past experience, I think, is very important. Um, as mentioned previously, um, I've never lost an election, and I have been elected by the citizens that will be voting in this district. I have served the citizens in the legislative branch, which will be the city council, and now in the Alabama House of Representatives. And I continue to serve these citizens. And so I don't think it's necessarily about who you know in Washington, D.C. You have to know the citizens of this district. I'm of this district, I've been a part of this district, serving this district for the last 20 years, and I think that uniquely gives you um, great experience on based off of what they need, what the community needs. It's, it's not necessarily about what Washington needs for us, it's what we need Washington to do for us. We need to take our voices to Washington, D.C., and not necessarily the other way around. Uh, relationships are important. But I think the relationships with the people on the ground are more important because that's how you can make sure that they get the necessary things that they need when you go to represent them in Washington, D.C. Thank you. Ms. Coleman, how has your past experience prepared you for this job? Thank you so much. 22 years of legislative service that I'll get a chance to take that to Washington, D.C. Uh, you will have a congresswoman who is dead ready on day one, I've served in leadership in the Alabama legislature, voted in all types of uh, legislation that the district wants, gaming, a lottery, champion for Medicaid expansion, red flag legislation to get illegal guns out of the hands of people who do not need them, voted for pay raises for teachers and state employees. I will take all of that in addition to my experience with economic development. I actually used to run the, the Department of Economic and Community Development for the city of Bessemer, but my lived experience. I was a single mother most of the time that I've served, so those issues that you care about, I care about too. I'm a military brat. My, my, my live with a real life American hero. My father served 22 years in the United States Air Force. So my legislative experience, my experience lobbying and working with members of Congress, along with my lived experience, prepare me to be the next Congresswoman for Congressional District 2. You mentioned the military, and that is the topic of our next question. We all support the U.S. military. We also know that the military is very important to the Congressional District 2 in Alabama. However, the military is struggling recruiting people it needs to serve. We'll start with you, Mr. Figures, on this topic. What needs to be done to make sure that our military is the best fighting force in the world? Yeah, I think. First off, thank you to every single person who has ever put on the uniform uh, to serve and defend uh, this nation um, from threats um, abroad and, and threats here domestically. Uh, we owe an enormous uh, debt of gratitude to all of our service members, of which I have several in my own family. Um, so thank you. Uh, listen, this, this district has a, a, a rich history in military service, going back to uh, the, the Tuskegee Airmen and the Red Tails. And, you know, one thing that we can learn from them is that the dedication uh, that it takes from our military, uh, the sacrifice that our men and women give us in the military is something that's worth um, us respecting, uh, us acknowledging, and us certainly doing what we can to make sure that they continue to receive all of the resources, the benefits, the pay, everything that they have earned in their service to this country. And so when we talk about readiness, military readiness for, uh, for our troops here in the United States, I think it starts with us incentivizing people uh, that serve our country by showing them that we have their backs, that we're there for them, and that when their service is over, this country will still be there for them. Thank you. Mr. Gray, what would you do to make sure our military remains the best fighting force in the world? When you think about the state of Alabama, it's the most military-friendly uh, state in America. Uh, many of the things that we do, like Purple Star designation, where we uh, really incentivize and give resources to those areas where, you know, military families are, are relocating. And when we think about just the legacy in general 
My great grandfather was a World War II veteran in the Navy. Uh, several members of my family are uh, part of the military. And for most people, it was a sense of pride. We have to get that back. We have to actually um, get that in the schools and have kids really want to fight and really want to honor their country. Uh, we are such at a, dis a divisive and this and this vision between these and ours that a lot of times the common man and woman, um, kids, teenagers, they don't really want, they don't really feel like they belong in America. And so we need to get that legacy concept back where we are uh, bringing our, our, our ROCT programs back into our high schools and creating a pathway where young people will want to go into the military. Mr. Bracey, we're talking about the military and what Congress can do to help address the recruiting struggles that our military has. Okay. I think we need to make sure that we definitely support uh, the Department of Defense funding. Um, I currently, in my day job, I work for Austin USA, a shipbuilder in Mobile, where we build uh, Navy ships and Coast Guard ships, and that's very, very important uh, to our local economy and also very important to our military. I have three brothers um, that served in the military, two of them Air Force, one in the Marines. One of my brothers retired from Maxwell, currently lives here in Montgomery. Uh, one of the most important things that we can do is on day one, I want to promote the fact that we have constituent service forms in our offices and we can go out and speak on behalf of these veterans to Veteran Affairs and other agencies to make sure that they get the benefits that they need. I don't think it's fair for our veterans to fight a war on behalf of the country and then have to come home and fight a war again just to get the benefits that they so rightly deserve. And I think that's our responsibility. They shouldn't have to call the VA. They should just be able to call me and I can get that done for them as their congressperson for this district. Thank you. Ms. Coleman, how do we support our military? Make sure that it has what it needs yeah. to be the best. Yeah, I think the, the, the best thing that we could do for recruitment to our military uh, armed forces is adequately pay our men and women in uniform. Um, and when I talked earlier about nuclear disarmament, which is a very small portion of the defense budget, some of that money actually could be shifted to make sure that we adequately pay our soldiers. So that would be one of the best recruitment tools. But then when it comes to our veterans, I've talked about my dad all the time. I live with an uh, American hero. We need to make sure the VA has the resources it needs to take care of our men and women in uniform once they retire while they're still serving. So again, shifting some of that budget from the nuclear piece to make sure that they are adequately paid, that is gonna be a huge recu re recruitment tool in our schools. If they know that they're gonna be able to go into a career field where they can travel the world and be paid to do that and also have the equipment that they need to stay protected, we will have young men and young women who want to go into the military like my father and my uncles did. Anthony Daniels, your thoughts ensuring that America's military remains the strongest and most powerful in the world. We certainly must increase our, our defense spending uh, and also for our military. Uh, we have about five military bases that sit within, that sit within or in proximity uh, to the Congressional District 2. And so what we got to do is make certain that we are uh, increasing our recruitment efforts, that we're providing more incentive for the men and women in, in uniform. But we're also making certain that once they retire from the military, that we have jobs and opportunities for them. I know that Alabama is, is one of the most military-friendly uh, states in the, in, in the country. And what we do for, mil uh, for veterans and, and with, their, with their retirement and their pensions, pensions is, is phenomenal. I think that we can do more. And so even military housing opportunities, we've seen an increase in um, uh, the, the lines uh, uh, veteran, uh, for vet veteran affairs. Uh, we want to make certain that we're making investments and in increasing the staff from veteran affairs, making certain that we're taking care of our military men and women after they've served. But while the, for those, in the, those that we're trying to recruit to go to the military, we have to increase what we're paying. We have to increase the military uh, the benefits for them, retirement benefits. And we have to make certain that we are educating our uh, young people and others on the, the importance of defending this country. Thank you. you. You talked about our younger voters, and younger voters have a lot of concern when it comes to the viability and the existence of Social Security. They fear just paying into a system is not going to benefit them by the time they turn around and retire. So Mr. Gray, 
are you concerned about the viability of Social Security, and what do you think should be done to shore it up? Yeah, there are several things that have been put in place, like extending Social Security. As long as we just need to reform and restructure, make sure that those young people that will be paying into it, that in 30 years and 40 years, they were able to get Social Security. And so it's really about defending, as a congressman, defending the Social Security Fund, uh, being on the front line, understanding that the American dream is to work and then retire. And so we can't do that if we don't have anything that what we pay into, we don't get anything out of. And so as a congressman, I'll fight tooth and nail to make sure that Social Security uh, will last now and forever. Over to Napoleon Bracey, the issues that face Social Security and your ideas for the future. Yeah, um, it, it's kind of funny. My first job out of college was actually with the Social Security Administration. Uh, so I had an opportunity to see a lot of things that, um, that I didn't like. And I had concerns as well as a young college graduate on if these benefits would be there, you know, when I actually retired. Because what I kept seeing was the retirement age sliding. You know, you had reduced benefits for taking the benefits earlier. And if you waited to receive your book, your full benefits, depending on the month and the year, you know, it just kind of continued to push back, but life expectancy continued to drop. Um, I think we have a responsibility to try to stabilize that, to make sure that people get the benefits that they paid in for, to make sure that, of course, Medicare is attached to that. With the insurance, we need to make sure that they have that as well. But we need to stabilize it and not try to make people wait until their life expectancy is at an end before they have the opportunity to actually get the benefits that they've worked so hard and put in and paid for. Thank you. Ms. Coleman, what are your concerns yeah. about Social Security and how do we shore it up? Sure, I'm, I'm 50 years old now, so um, although people on the campaign trail have been giving me so many compliments, but I'm 50, of course, so I'm thinking about um, uh, uh, retirement myself. But one of the ways that we're going to have to be able to shore up um, uh, Social Security so I can have it, um, the members of Congressional District uh, 2 can have it, and our young people can have it, we're going to have to roll back the tax cuts to the wealthy um, that the Trump administration championed. We're going to have to make sure that corporations in this country pay their fair share in taxes. It is unfortunate that a secretary in a corporation would pay more in a percentage of taxes, income tax, than the CEO. So we're going to have to change that at the federal level, make sure that these corporations pay their fair share, and make sure that we roll back these tax cuts for the wealthy so we will have a Social Security for me, for the folks that are on this panel, but especially for our young people who are just now getting their careers started. Thank you. And Mr. Daniels, your thoughts on Social Security? Is it a problem and how would you fix it? Well, any effort to prioritize Social Security will be something that I'll vote against in Congress. Uh, we must protect Social Security, making certain that those that are in the system right now are able to retire uh, without any fear. Uh, and that those that are want to come into the system, that they have some certainty that the investments that are made by their congressmen and the fight, that fight by their congressmen of, of investing more in Social Security and making certain that the federal government is spending more and they're looking at ways to ensure that Social Security is, is stable long term. Uh, we, there's no families or no person should be living in fear. After we tell them that, hey, you make these investments and you work and you work hard and you do everything that you're supposed to do as an American, that we're going to take care, we're going to make certain that you're taken care of on the, on the back end. And so we should be making those investments. We should make certain that uh, any attempt to, we should oppose any attempt to prioritize Social Security and make certain that we're continuing to make the investments that, that's needed to ensure that our, our future workforce, current and future workforce, has certainty that, they, that Social Security will not experience any cuts. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Figures, you will have the last word on this question. Your message to voters concerned about Social Security not being there for them. Yeah, we, we have to. We have to do absolutely everything that we can to protect Social Security for people who are currently um, paying into the system, for people who have already paid into the system, uh, and for future generations. Listen, this is a, um, uh, America made a deal with people. They made a deal with workers. That if you live here, you work here, you work hard, you pay into the system, the system will be here to provide social protections for you when, as you get older. 
and we have to make America live up to, the, um, to their end of the bargain on that. And as Congressman, that is exactly what I would do. The, the baby boomer generation is the generation right now where this issue has become um, most pervasive and that you had so many people in the workforce and fewer people coming into the workforce and more people going out of the workforce. Um, they earn their rights. Um, so they should never, they, they are commonly referred to as America's greatest generation. They should never live with the threat of not being able to afford their prescription medication because Social Security benefits will not be there for them. So as your congressman, I will go to work every single day with that as my top priority to make sure that we're protecting our seniors and we're protecting people who have already lived up to their end of the promise that America made with them. Our next question, and we'll start with Mr. Bracey this time. Where do you stand on the idea of defending democracy abroad? We're talking specifically about U.S. financial support of Ukraine and Israel. You have 60 seconds. Thank you. Um, I think that's a great question. Whenever we have allies, I think we have a responsibility to support our allies. We have a responsibility of helping them to maintain a good um, good democracy in their country. Uh, we have a, a responsibility of helping them remain strong and sovereign, and we have a responsibility to making sure that they have the relief aid that they need and the equipment that they need to be able to protect themselves. Um, I think that's very important. Um, it's an issue that's been in the forefront uh, of our country right now, and I think we need to live up to our end of the bargain and to make sure that we have and give them the things that they need to be successful. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, one of the things that seem to be an issue is tying those things together with other issues. Um, I think these are singular issues, and we need to continue to, uh, to do our parts to protect our allies and make sure that they have the things needed to be able to protect, um, protect themselves and make sure that, um, that we continue to live up to our end of the bargain in the deal. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Coleman, where do you stand on yeah. the idea of defending democracy by financially supporting Ukraine and also our ally, Israel? Yeah, I think 100% um, we should support our allies financially. However, um, we should not give them a blank check. We need to make sure that we're monitoring how the dollars are used. Um, but then you also have to think about the district, Congressional District 2, but even Alabamians. I still teach right now, I teach at Miles College, and when I'm talking to my students even about the connection of international affairs to what's going on in this country. When people have crime that is, uh, you know, is, is permeating through their community, they have issues with housing, they can't afford milk or eggs, it's hard to, to convince them that we also need to be putting money abroad. But we do that because we are protecting our democracy. When we're protecting democracies internationally, we're also protecting democracy at home. That's why we do it. So some of the rhetoric that goes on from the right about nation first, nation first, it actually, that actually threatens our national security when we don't help our allies abroad. So 100%, I support protecting and supporting financially our allies abroad. Of course, we know Israel is fighting Hamas and Ukraine is fighting against a Russian invasion. There have been questions, though, among some in Congress about whether or not the U.S. should continue to uh, fund those two wars. Mr. Daniels, what do you think? Absolutely. Uh, I know I'm, I support funding for both Israel and Ukraine. Uh, what we have to understand is there are five military bases within this particular, in pro and in, in directly in or in proximity to this congressional district. Some are indirectly and directly impacted by the funding, the spending that we are doing to Ukraine and Israel. Um, right in Pike County, as I mentioned before, in Pike County uh, at the Lockheed Martin plant, uh, they're the ones that are supplying the Javelin missile to uh, Ukraine. And so they're being made right here in Alabama, made in Alabama. And so any uh, efforts to not support uh, um, supporting our allies can directly and indirectly job growth and opportunity within the state of Alabama. Uh, we must also continue to, to support our allies. Uh, we, had an agree we have an agreement with our allies to help and, and help them and defend them and take a position, uh, and, and that's something that we must do. And so any, the funding uh, to Ukraine, the funding to Israel is something that I will 100% support. Thank you. Mr. Figures, your response. Where do you stand on the idea of defending democracy by financially supporting Ukraine and our ally Israel? So, look, we, we, we have to support our allies, uh, period. We have to be there for them. 
These are strategic partnerships that we have across the country, not just in Ukraine and Israel, but these are strategic partnerships that we have across the world um, that we benefit immensely from in, in terms of uh, intelligence share, sharing, intelligence gathering, resource sharing, uh, that helps us thwart off attacks, uh, both known and unknown, uh, domestically here in the United States. Look, I had the, uh, when I was at the Department of Justice, I actually had the opportunity to go over to The Hague in the Netherlands and actually see how people look to America for support. Um, in actually uh, uh, standing up um, the, the, the criminal tribunals that will follow from the, uh, the Russian-Ukraine conflict. So people look to America for support. People need America for support. There's a role that we have to play on the international stage that keeps us safe here um, and abroad. Um, however, uh, I think that we also must prioritize funding, not just with war zones abroad, but we have too many of our communities here domestically that are also war zones, and we're losing too many of our children to gun violence across this district, and I think we should equally prioritize sending resources and funding to those communities to alleviate that crisis as well. And Mr. Gray, your thoughts on U.S. financial aid to Ukraine and Israel? Like all of my colleagues, I agree that we must uh, fund Israel and Ukraine. When we think about um, the United States, uh, the military is the biggest asset, and we have to stabilize our positions. And things like that help us to stabilize the economy, the workforce, make sure that as a national security threat that we're good over here in America. And so funding our allies, sticking to the script, that the promise that we made, I think it's significant. But when we think about uh, the lives that have been ruined in somewhere like Palestine, we also have to be a country of peace and understand that there could be a two-state solution and that we should also call for a ceasefire. And so that we should fund, but we also should think about humanity and think about the diplomacy as the United States because we don't want to be known as a country that hurts the, the, the weakest of these and the least of these. Thank you. Time flies when you're having fun. Mm -hmm. This is our final question for the forum. Uh, Alabama in recent years has worked to improve mental health care by opening multiple crisis centers to help those in need, especially crisis out of jails. This effort seems to be working, but directly, Ms. Coleman, what else from a federal level would you do to help improve mental health? Yeah, great question. So um, I'm going to be very transparent. In, the, uh, in 2020, um, I lost my husband on February 14th, Valentine's Day 2020. Shortly after that, um, I lost five family members to COVID. And for the first time in my life, I actually dealt with depression. Never dealt with it before. Um, and it was uh, telemedicine, really, because we were in lockdown, um, where I was able to talk to a therapist every day for a while, and then ultimately once a month, till I got to the point that I could, I could pull myself out of that. But on the federal level, because I think that what we really need to do is also look at um, having, a, 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 as a part of Family and Medical Leave Act, and even within our schools, a mental health day as an excusable day. We know actually because of 2020, because of lockdown, so many people are dealing with mental health issues and it's become, uh, it, it, it used to be unpopular to talk about, of course, in certain communities, but now at the federal level, we need to do something to make sure when folks are having a mental health crisis, whether in schools or at work, that that is an excusable reason to take off. Mr. Daniels, your thoughts on what uh, Congress can do to improve the mental health care that we all are able to access? First, I would like to say that uh, mental, the mental health crisis that we're facing in this country is a public health crisis. First, Congress needs to recognize mental health, the mental health crisis as a public health crisis. Um, what we're experiencing right here in the state of Alabama uh, is we've seen, we're seeing the number of uh, mental health uh, cases increase, uh, but we continue to pass legislation that uh, directly and indirectly harm our community, like permitless carry. Uh, allowing a person that's mentally ill to have access to a weapon without uh, getting a, a gun, I mean, get, uh, without a um, permit. And so those are some of the loopholes that we must close at the state level. At the federal level, uh, we must um, triple our funding uh, for mental health um, crisis centers across the country, not just in Alabama, but across the country. And across the second congressional district, there have been a closure of a mental health hospital down in South Alabama that we need to make certain that we reopen and, and make investments in adding crisis centers all throughout the state of Alabama and adding additional uh, support for our schools. 
uh, the state of Alabama put in some mental health uh, counselors uh, within the, within the, um, the school system, uh, as well as law enforcement. And so we have to increase our funding for all levels of government uh, to to make certain that we have people have access to to mental health counsel counselors and getting the help that they need. Because incarcerating them is not the key to solve the mental health crisis in the state of Alabama. Thank you. Mr. Figures, what else from a federal level would you do to improve mental health care? Look, mental, mental health is a, um, it, it's a, it's a vital, a vital, vital part um, of the lives of every American. And most Americans uh, know that personal feeling um, of having to deal with uh, mental health challenges, whether it's themselves or whether it's someone there in their family. They know that feeling of helplessness, that feeling of loneliness, that feeling of isolation, that feeling of, 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 of true and genuine fear, um, of not knowing what's going to happen to them um, or to someone that they love. These are, these are uh, feelings that, that all too many people in this district know, know very well. And the common thread in, in people that have experienced this is that they wish they had more. They wish they had more resources. They wish they had more knowledge. They, miss, they, they wish they had more uh, opportunity to access the types of treatment, the types of services that are needed um, to provide the sort of relief that they can in these situations. So as a congressman, I would fight every single day to make sure that we're bringing more funding, more resources home to this district to establish more mental health um, services, get more school personnel equipped uh, to identify and respond to the mental health needs of our children, and also within our criminal justice system, because I too agree that incarceration is not the, is not the place and our law enforcement officers are not the ones that should be responding to mental health crises. We know that a lack of adequate mental health care can lead to tragedy. Mr. Gray, your thoughts on the issue and what Congress can do about it? Yeah, one thing when I look at as a, as a lawmaker, I had just the honor of being the yoga man. I was able to repeal the 28 year ban on yoga in Alabama. And we understand that it caught so many issues around religion, but from a world perspective, yoga helps with those stressors, uh, anxiety, expectation, uh, those daily tools or needs that young people need. We understand that teenagers have the highest suicide rate. And so when we, we think about things like that, and we think about programs like the Halitzi Hope Foundation that the state awarded $500,000 to actually put mental health programs in the high school so that kids can actually understand mental health and find a pathway um, to being resilient and, and being treated. And so when we think about that from a congressional level, I'll just continue to do more of that, more funding to uh, veterans' mental health, children's mental health, and, and increasing the money towards mental health and social workers. I think that's the key because everyone has trauma, but we have to start early. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bracey, what else from a federal level would you do to improve mental health care? One of the first things I would do when it comes to uh, mental health in the state is I would look at trying to get Searcy Medical Center reopened. Uh, that was a horrible thing that happened in 2010, 2011 when Searcy closed uh, because it took away the mental health facility for South Alabama. Another thing that I would try to do is make sure that we properly fund the 988 program to make sure that when someone is in a mental health crisis and they make that phone call, that we have trained workers going out to make sure that they have what they need. The next thing that I would do is fully fund the JAG program. The JAG program will allow police officers, will allow municipalities to hire police officers for three years. And one of the things that they can do is make sure that they have mental health training by these officers because some of the times we see when police officers go into these situations and they think it's a violent situation and they don't really know how to deal with it because they don't have the proper mental health training to deal with the, the current situations or the cause that they're going on. Thank you. Thank you. We have a little more time left and that means we can provide each of you with a chance to wrap things up for us, talk about issues perhaps that are important to you that we've not yet addressed, or talk about a summary of your campaign. You'll have a minute 30 for these final statements, and we'll start with Anthony Daniels. Thank you. Um, for me, uh, this election is extremely important. We have to send someone to Washington, D.C. that have the experience of working with other politicians and being able to deliver service all throughout the 2nd Congressional District and the state of Alabama. 
you know, there are individuals that are, are running for office that have the opportunity to, to make a difference, but they have the track record of make, actually making a difference. And I'd like to also stand, uh, have my colleagues stand corrected that I've worked in Washington, D.C. And, and, and what I would say is that we got to send someone that actually know what to do on day one know how to interact with the other politicians and getting things done, uh, understanding the process from, the, from a legislative branch perspective and being on the elected side, not the staff side. And I will say the, the other thing I will say, when we're advising, if we have individuals that have experience advising uh, at the federal level, but the state of Alabama continue to be behind, you know, we have, you have the opportunity to, to advise about the, the, the Attorney General of the United States of America on issues that impact police shootings. Why is it that Alabama in, uh, officer involved shootings in the state of Alabama have never been addressed? Why haven't the uh, overcrowdedness of the prisons that uh, Judge Thompson said that the state of Alabama have overcrowdedness, but the Justice Department has failed to, to, to enact on it? And so if we're going to elect someone from this district that truly represent and have a track record of delivering things for Alabama, not other places, elect Anthony Daniels on March 5th. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Figures, your final thought, your message now to the voter. Well, first I want to thank the hosts. Um, you guys have done a wonderful job tonight and thank the, uh, the Democratic Party for putting this on and, and Troy University. Uh, listen, this is, um, this is an important election and we have the opportunity to send someone to, to Washington, D.C. that can actually uh, get things done and has worked on getting things done um, on behalf of the people of Alabama. Um, look, whether it's working uh, for President Obama, uh, building out the teams that would go into agencies to implement the Affordable Care Act, whether it's advising an attorney general um, on the president's clemency initiative, which righted the wrong sentences, the harshly, uh, overly long prison sentences that sent too many black and brown uh, people to prison under um, uh, the crack cocaine laws of the, the 90s and, and 2000s. Um, we've been there. And by we, I mean the state of Alabama, because I've taken Alabama with me in every single room that I've ever sat with, uh, sat in in Washington, D.C. And yes, I have had the opportunity to, um, uh, to advise uh, senior government leaders, um, and, and we've done good work. Um, but some of my colleagues on this stage have sat in the Alabama State Legislature, and they take credit for the things that are good, but deflect blame for the things that are bad. So there's certainly progress to be made um, in the state of Alabama for the people in this district. And what we must prioritize, what we must prioritize is sending someone to Washington that can connect to the people in this district, that lives amongst the people in this district, that do not live closer to Ohio than they do to people in Mobile. There are people in this district that need to have the representation in Washington, D.C. that has the reputation of getting things done and has the capacity to get things done. And I ask for your vote and your support on March the 5th. Thank you. Thank you. And Mr. Gray, your closing thoughts for today. Yes, thank you. I think about a quote. It said that leadership is not a person, it's an activity. And I think, and I look on my life, I've been committed in every phase of life, whether it was on the football field, at the Curtis House, in, at, in the community, or lunch in a small business, or at, at the State House. I've delivered results, and, I, and you can count on me to deliver solutions um, for Phoenix City, Montgomery, Mobile, and everywhere in between. When we kind of think about this, we have a once in a life, lifetime, generation of lifetime opportunity to elect a second black congressional member to Congress from Alabama. But this is a historic moment. It can't be business as usual, electing the same old politicians that are just running for a title. As your state, as your next state, as your next congressperson, I'm standing on the business of the people. I'm just a small kid raised by a single parent at grandma's house in East Alabama, I have a vested interest in seeing these communities flourish. That's why on March 5th, I plan to cast a ballot for myself and I ask, and I ask people, will they cast a ballot for Jeremy Gray too? Um, I'm Jeremy Gray, I'm running for Congress. And to learn more about our campaign, visit JeremyGrayForCongress.com. Thank you, Mr. Gray. Mr. Bracey, your turn now, final thoughts and what you want the voters to know. Thank you. Um, as I travel the district, the, the one common thing that I keep hearing is people need opportunities. I have built my campaign around people having opportunities for good paying jobs and opportunities for their children that go off to college to be able to come home and receive employment at home. 
the reason why this came to my attention was right after college, when I moved back home, it was very difficult to find good gainful employment. We have to do better. We have to ask these businesses that locate in our communities to be good corporate citizens and make sure that they provide opportunities for our citizens. I've helped create programs that put businesses inside of public schools in Mobile County that have created pipelines for employment, and we can do that throughout this entire district. I have hired more people, had a hand in hiring more people in South Alabama than any one particular person over the last 11 years because of my involvement in this. I believe in creating opportunities for people. I hate when I talk to parents and they say they put their children on a school bus to go off to college and their children never ever return home because they don't have opportunities. Our children should leave if they want to leave. They should not leave because they have to leave. We have to do better. We have to put things in place to make sure that we can provide for our families at home in this district. And that's how we can turn our district around and we can help our economy and we can make sure that people can feed their families in order to solve a lot of issues that we have right here in this community. Uh, if you want to, you can visit our website at napoleonbracy.com and I personally ask you for your vote on March the 5th. Thank you. And Ms. Coleman, final words from you today. Thank you so much for the organizers. Again, I'm State Senator Marika Coleman, and I'm running for Congress because I've been told by Congressional District 2, you need a fighter in Washington, D.C. And I think that the best indicator for what a person will do for you is what they've already done. So I'm asking you all to Google my name. The things that I've talked about today are not aspirational. I have a 22-year record of production for the state of Alabama, which includes Congressional District 2. So just make sure you spell my, my first name right, M-E-R-I-K-A. Um, so again, I just, you, you will have a fighter in Marika Coleman. I've brought uh, millions of dollars to the state of Alabama in parks, roads, economic development. Our signature program for Congressional D District 2 is going to be a one-stop shop for resources. That's the one common thing that I've heard throughout Congressional District 2. I think that we can solve the problems ourselves if we have the money that we need for our nonprofit agencies, for our small businesses, for our entrepreneurs, for our faith-based organizations. So when Marika called me, you'll get a congressional member that is ready on day one that will be fighting for women's reproductive rights, fighting for the decriminalization of marijuana and all of those tough issues, but will also bring the bacon home to make sure that Congressional District 2 gets the resources that you deserve, not just because I dream of it, but because I already have a track record of production. So please go to my website, marikaforcongress.com, and on March 5th, go for the goal, vote for Marika Coleman for Congressional District 2. All right, thank you. We do have an important vote March 5th, and you've had the opportunity to hear from the candidates. This concludes our Democratic portion of the forum where have they talked about connectivity, mental health, immigration, inflation. Uh, candidates, of course, we certainly appreciate your time and attention and in joining us today. Thank you for being here. We'll talk next with the Republicans, so stay tuned. WSFA 12 News and Fox 10 WALA bring you Alabama's District 2 Republican Congressional Forum with candidates Greg Albritton, Dick Brubaker, Caroline Dobson, Carla M. Dupriest, Hampton S. Harris, and Belinda Thomas. Tonight's forum is sponsored by All In Credit Union and Southern Cancer Center. Hello and welcome back to this special election forum brought to you by WSFA 12 News in Montgomery and Fox 10 in Mobile. We're glad you're watching. We are coming to you from the Davis Theater in downtown Montgomery on the campus of Troy University, Montgomery. I'm Mark Bullock. And I'm Lenny Slagon. You know, for the first time in years, Alabama's second congressional district has no incumbent. That's because the district map was recently redrawn and it now stretches across portions of both Montgomery and Mobile. Uh, these are places also in between. So we have a number of candidates now running for that seat. That's right. We introduced you to the Democrats earlier. Now it is the Republicans' turn and there are six candidates joining us today. Each candidate will get 60 seconds to answer our questions, and we also want to begin with a chance for them to provide a basic introduction. And we want to start 
with candidate Greg Albritton. Mr. Albritton, your introduction. Thank you. I'm Greg Albritton. I've lived in this district of District 2 now for since 1987. My wife, Deborah, has taught school in most of these counties, including Mobile and Monroe and Conecuh. My kids have gone to school in LaFleur, Phillips, Sims, graduated in Evergreen and XL. I went to law school at Jones in Montgomery and then practiced law from Montgomery down to Mobile and from Clark all the way over to Covington. I know this district. I know what its needs are. I live here. I enjoy public life. My public life includes 24 years in the military, 22 years in the practice of law. I've been able to do some good things. We've helped get roads paved in our rural counties. We've helped uh, Montgomery with the circumstances that they found themselves in and Mobile, expanding the port and the airport. I'm Greg Albritton. I'm your next congressman. And next up, Dick Brubaker, another familiar face in uh, Alabama politics. Sir, you have 60 seconds. Thank you. Uh, my name's Dick Brubaker. I have five wonderful children. I've been married to my wife, Ruth, and we've spent our entire married life here in District 2. I've represented this area in the legislature. And when I left the legislature in 2018, I never thought I'd get back into politics. I'm running for Congress because I believe that this country is in trouble. We're in danger of losing the America we grew up in, and I think it's time to put people in Congress who will push back and stand for the values that we all hold as important. I think it's time to, I think our liberties are in danger, our national security is in, we're more at risk now than we've been in since World War II. And the inflation that's hurting our families is a direct result of bad policy coming from Washington. When I was a legislator, I was good at solving problems. I would like to go to Washington and see if I can solve those. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Caroline Dobson is also joining us, another of our Republican candidates in this District 2 race. Your introduction. Good evening. I'm Caroline Dobson, and I'm running to fight for Alabama families. I was the first Republican to qualify in this race, but I've never been in politics. I grew up on a farm in Monroe County. I now live in Montgomery, where I practice real estate law and serve on the Alabama Forestry Commission. My husband and I are so proud to be raising our girls here, but our country's in trouble between securing the border, supporting our military, fighting for Christian values, pushing for energy independence, balancing the budget, there's real work to be done, and we don't need to send more career politicians to Washington. If you send me, I will stand up against the left, but otherwise keep my head down and work hard to actually pass laws that restore our freedom and protect our values. I've been endorsed by the Alabama Farmers Federation because they know that I have what it takes to defeat the Democrats in November and to fight for conservative values. I ask you to join me. Vote Caroline Dobson on March 5th. And now, Ms. Carla DePriest, it is your turn for a brief introduction. You have 60 seconds. My name is wife, mother, businesswoman, and public servant, and sometimes Carla DePriest. My vision is to unite America in a heavenly way, building bridges where they say there, there is no way. Congress has to stop fighting like cats in the dark. Being a voice for the people as we fight together for better schools for our children through accountable school choice. As a small business owner of Chris and Carla's Heavenly Ribs, you don't need teeth to eat them, I will be an advocate for small businesses to have access to resources and training. As the mother of a disabled veteran recovering from post-traumatic stress, we need VA services that they can access for medical and mental treatment that does not take three months to schedule. Moving mountains where they say that there is no way. But we will not be moving our conservative principles. I'm Carla Dupree. I appreciate your vote on March 5th. And now we have Hampton Harris. It is your opportunity to introduce yourself now. My name is Hampton Harris, and I'm your true conservative choice for the district. 
I grew up right here in Montgomery, and I was homeschooled along with my six other siblings, where I was instilled with Christian conservative values that are still the backbone of my everyday life. And I stayed true to my roots and went to a local college right here in Montgomery where I was able to get a degree in economics and work in our healthcare system and see how our healthcare system needs help. I'm the husband of an active duty Air Force officer and she is an attorney for our Air Force. So I know and understand the amount of needs our military has. I am uh, extremely well back in my values and will not back down from a fight and I will stand up for Alabamians. All right, thank you, sir. Next, Belinda Thomas, uh, your turn now to tell people who you are. Well, good morning. I am Councilwoman Belinda Thomas. I earned that title by working hard, standing up for the town of Newton. I became the first African American to ever be elected to the city of Newton. I am the only elected African American as a Republican female in the state of Alabama and I want to take that fight to Congress because we need representation due to the redistricting and the gerrymandering that's taking place in Alabama. I will be the voice. I will support the party with integrity, with respect and uphold our values. I became a widow at 30, raised my four children by myself. I watched my husband be murdered. It didn't stop me. So if I can take on that fight, I can fight for the people of Alabama. I can fight for this new district. I can rep this, represent this new district to the highest of my ability. I am Belinda Thomas. Vote for me on March the 5th. All right, and there you have it, your candidates for District 2. And now let's go ahead and start with our questions. Just to reiterate, each candidate will have one minute to answer, you have your time cues here. Please pay attention to those. Starting now with question one. If there is one constant complaint from Alabama residents about Congress, it's the gridlock and inability to get things done. If you are elected to represent District 2, how would you navigate that gridlock to work with those on the other side? And Mr. Brubaker, we will start with you, your answer. Uh, thank you. Gridlock in Congress is proverbial, uh, but the way to approach it is you can't sacrifice your values just so you can say you worked with the other side. But I think that if you, when I was in the legislature, I always took a problem-solving approach to legislation, and if you ap approach a problem from the idea of solving it, you can usually find reasonable people who are willing to help you solve it. When state government tried to outlaw homeschooling, I wrote and passed a bill that gave homeschoolers the first legal protections they've ever had under Alabama law. And believe it or not, people on both sides of the aisle supported that agenda. And there is a way to do it, but you can't sacrifice conservative values just so you can say you got bipartisan support and just to say you passed a bill. If you approach things from a problem-solving perspective, you can get things done. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Now to Caroline Dobson. Your answer about gridlock in Congress. We're seeing it as we speak. It's been happening this week. How would you go about addressing that and compromising and getting things passed while you're in office? Well, the easiest way to eliminate legislative gridlock is to increase our Republican majority in the House. That is why this race is so vital to controlling the House. We just, we just lost a seat in New York on Tuesday. So that's why it's so important that we keep this seat red. If you send me to Washington, I will fully work with President Trump to fix the economy and secure our borders. And look, I'm running to fight for Alabama families, so of course I will work with anyone who's going to make our country safer, more secure, more prosperous, more faith-based, but I will not compromise my conservative values to do that. For too long, we've had leaders and career politicians who have failed to accept that there is right and wrong in this country, and we need more folks, more leaders, to stand up for the truth in Washington. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Priest, your answer to this question, how would you navigate all the gridlock and work 
with others on the other side in our nation's capital. As our founding fathers worked together to develop the best democracy and to develop our country as a beacon for the rest of the world, I bring my experience as being a district manager for Congressman Dick Nichols of Kansas. I was in Washington at a time when the dogs and cats work together. And I, as I said in my opening remarks, I have a vision that we can do that again. We cannot continue to take sides and not do what is best for the people of the United States. Traveling throughout the country, I have met senior citizens that can't live uh, with the rise in prices. I met the disabled veterans that I see on the side of the road that breaks my heart. So we have to find a happy medium where we can work together. And I've seen it done before when I was in Washington, and I believe that it can be done again. Mr. Harris, we're talking about ongoing gridlock in our nation's capital. How would you go about navigating that and actually getting legislation passed? Well, long gone are the days of the blue dog Democrats, and working across the aisle has become extremely hard because the left wing and the Democrats have become so entrenched and ingrained in their ways, they're not willing to give up anything when you come to compromise. And when one side does not give up anything in a compromise, that's called surrender. But, and I'm not going to surrender my values in order to make deals with the other side. I'm going to stick with my conservative values and make sure that we protect Alabamians' values. Because what's been going on in politics is so many of our politicians are giving up on their values just to get reelected or because they're scared the left is going to cancel them. And I will not back down from my Christian conservative values. I will be sure to always stand by them and give Alabama a voice. Thank you. And lastly, Ms. Thomas, let's talk about that gridlock in Washington and how you would go about navigating it and actually getting something accomplished for the voters. Well, with my experience of being Newton City Council, I've had to be in positions where I had to be the listener. And so I would listen and make concise decisions where it would not compromise our conservative values or the values of the people that I represent in the state of Alabama. So I would listen. And if there, there are things that will not jeopardize Alabama and my values, then I will consider what I do based on what's best for the people and the state that I represent. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Albritton, uh, we're, we're talking about the possibility of you representing District 2. Should you do that, how are you going to navigate the gridlock and work with those on the other side in our nation's capital? Good question, uh, because I, I've heard uh, today uh, there's been a lot of discussion about fight and let's go in and let's fight. Fighting is necessary many times, but, but we've got to not have chips on our shoulders. We've got to understand that it's not just about policy. It is about relationships. It's about doing what's right and about doing what's, what we can to get accomplished. Very often, it's not a matter of what's right or wrong. It's a matter of what you can get past and how you can accomplish good. That's, you may not be able to get great. You may not even get the best. But you've got to be able to work across the aisle and not just across the aisle, but with our own party members. If you'll notice, we have our own fights going on. We've got to make sure that we go in and deal with individuals and work with them together. I've done that. I've done that in the legislature. I've done that in many ways. I can do that, and I want that opportunity. Thank you, sir. Now for question number two, and it's immigration, another hot topic. More than a million illegal immigrants have crossed into the U.S. from the across the Mexico border in the last year. It's estimated that the total number of undocumented migrants has doubled in the last four years. So our question is, how would you rework the past failed immigration bill, the one that we just saw work its way through Congress but ultimately fail? And we'll start with Mrs. Dobson this time. Thank you. Yes, this is a full-on invasion. Um, as, as we're talking here today, we have illegals flooding across our border. If you want to talk about who's plotting insurrection, it's Biden with his open border policy. 
So we have to close the border, not, not let in 5,000 here and, and 800 there. We have got to close the border, complete building the wall, send everyone home, and enforce the stay in Mexico policy. It's not just the crime and the drugs, uh, the terrorist cells, the diseases that are coming across the border, not even addressing all of those issues, just the sheer number of non-taxpayers who are coming here relying on our social services is going to cause our country to collapse if something is not done. So we, we've got to send everyone home, close the border, and enforce the stay in Mexico policy. Ms. Dupree's voters have said immigration is very important to them. How would you work to get the pass failed immigration bill and so that we have other reforms passed? That's the key word, passed. We don't have open doors to our homes, so we shouldn't have an open border. We need to restore the funding that they have for border security. We need to increase funding for the number of border uh, patrols that we have down there. Of course, um, build the wall. And I strong feel, strongly feel that the system that we currently have, that those laws need to be enforced. And once we can get to the point of getting that enforcement with um, having legislation that's passed by both sides to do what is best for the citizens of the United States, then we too can have a, a closed border again. Mr. Harris, as we mentioned, a bipartisan immigration reform bill went before Congress just this month, and yet it still, despite the fact it was bipartisan, was unable to be passed. How would you go about changing that reform bill so that it could be passed? Well, we must focus on shutting our border. It's very important. <clears throat> and uh, we've had over 10 million immigrants encounters or gotaways at the border has been estimated since Biden has taken office. And the average American family spent over $1,100 last year on illegal immigration. And again, our veterans felt the brunt of this because our VA now is taking care of illegal immigrants rather than taking care of our own veterans. And crime is rising and drugs are flooding over, not to mention a lot of the people coming over are on terrorist watch lists and from prisons, mental institutions, and there's a lot of people out there that want to do America harm. So we need to have a secure border and be secure here at home. And to do that, we must deport those who have entered illegally and close our border, finish the wall, and make sure to put America first and pass legislation like HR2, which will end catch and release and make sure we keep our nation and our families safe because every border, I mean, every state is a border state. Thank you. All right, Ms. Thomas, your turn now to answer the question, how would you rework the past failed legislation or immigration bill to get reforms passed if elected? Well, I agree with everybody here. We need to secure our, our borders. And it's very personal to me, seeing that I have uh, a Cuban daughter-in-law who came here legally and did it the right way. So it's unfair to my family for the, the immigrants to be able to come here and get the resources that my daughter-in-law had to work for um, and the expenses that is putting on the American taxpayers overriding our schools. Um, it's America is the country for law and our legislators right now that's in place are showing a bad example by executing that law. So we need to put, push for border reform, push to build that wall, push for the law and order, and save our country from all of the immigrants and the expenses that they're putting on the American people. Thank you. And now to Mr. Albritton. As you know, a piece of legislation developed in a bipartisan way would have addressed a lot of the concerns people have about the uh, Mexican border with the U.S. However, it still was unable to be passed by uh, members of Congress in Washington. How would you go about changing the legislation so it would be passed? If you're asking me about the uh, bill that was passed out of the Senate, uh, I would not change that bill. In fact, we do not need another law passed. Another law passed and ignored is not going to help. We have the laws in place already. We have the laws already to enforce the borders. 
We simply, the executive and the administration, is not enforcing them. That's our problem. It is not a matter that we need to pass another law. It is not a matter that we need to have additional taxation or additional funds. We have those resources already. We have the means to shut the border down. We've done it already. The problem is, and what is good, is that we have taken the appropriate steps that Congress can do, which is impeach the guy that should have been doing it. That's what we should have done. That's what has been done now. We need to do more of that and enforce the law, seal the borders, and take care of our own folks. Mr. Brubaker, your turn. How would you work? What would you change, if anything, with the pass failed immigration bill to get reforms passed? But this isn't complicated. Everyone knows what the solution is, just no one seems to have the will to do it. We've got to build the wall, finish the wall, aggressively patrol the border, including the use of the National Guard and the military, if that's what's necessary. And when people come into our country illegally, we need to send them home. What we're currently doing is incentivizing illegal immigration by offering housing, uh, debit cards, and if people knew that when they got to the United States they were going to uh, end up on, a pl on the first plane back to wherever they came from, I think you'd have fewer people trying to enter. I think we also need to realize the effect of this Ill illegal immigration, we're losing 150 American lives a day to fentanyl poisoning. The common denominator in all this is Mexico. All of the illegal immigrants, all the illegal drugs, all the hu human trafficking is coming through Mexico. I think it's time to re-examine our relationship and push Mexico to play its part in stopping this invasion. It's time to start playing hardball. Parental rights and education reform are increasingly important issues among voters across the country, with some calling on Congress to pass a federal tax credit for alternative education expenses. Directing this question first to you, Mr. Priest, what would you do, would you support this step, and what other actions would you take to reassure parents out there who are concerned? The issue of school choice or parental rights has been an issue that's been on the forefront of my campaign for years. I grew up on 11th Street in Mobile Terrace, which is a community that resembles 11 of the counties in the Black Belt that we are all out here campaigning to represent. I say to you, am I to believe my lying eyes or my lying ears? When I look at these communities and I see that these children do not have the tools, the facilities, or sometimes hungry when they uh, go to school, don't have proper clothing, that, that we as a government are doing our very best. As I stated, I grew up on 11th Street in Mobile Terrace. It's a community that looks a lot like it did when I was back there in the 60s. When I am in Congress, if I have to think outside of the box to get profit, uh, nonprofit organizations to address these issues, then that is what I'm going to do. But the government has to do its part as well. Mr. Harris, the question is, what can the federal government do to improve education? More specifically, would you be in favor of a federal tax credit that would help parents pay for alternative forms of education? Well, I'm a very strong proponent of parental rights and education. I am myself a product of that. I was homeschooled throughout high school. And so I know firsthand how it is to be a product of that. And no one knows their child like their parent does. And we've seen the way the government runs things, and we don't want them running our lives and running uh, how we teach our children and what they are taught. That's one of the problems with what is going on now is they're removing prayer from school, but, but they're also allowing men to go compete in women's sports. And so we do not need the government getting involved in what our children are taught. And we should be hesitant on allowing them to get further involved because what the school pay, I mean, what the government pays for today, it will control tomorrow. And the government does not need to be the leader of a family or tell a parent what they can or cannot do with their child because that parent knows what is best for their children. Mrs. Thomas, uh, for parents who feel as though their children have inadequate education, would you support a tax credit allowing them other options? And how else do you see the uh, federal government as 
being able to improve education across the country? Well, first we have to understand and in, that parents entrust the school to educate their children, not socialize them, not change them, but to educate them. And the parents need to have the right of choice to participate and making sure that the government is not uh, socializing their children and being a part of their education system. And what I would, what I would like to see and push for is that we have more support for the parents to be involved with the children's education so that they know what their children are being taught. And that, that is what I would push to take place. Mr. Albritton, we're, we're talking about alternate education expenses and a possible tax credit for that. Would you support this step? And what other actions would you take to make sure parents out there are reassured? Every school choice uh, bill that has been brought forward uh, in Alabama, I've supported, I've signed on to, I've, I've worked to try to get it passed. We have another one now that the governor has sponsored that's uh, uh, on the floors of uh, the legislature uh, this week. We're, we're trying to get those done. I support those. Uh, the best thing the federal government can do as far as our school uh, issues is get out of the way. Leave us alone. Uh, get, don't, don't interfere. The last thing we need is more interference. Because our schools too often have become, for rightly security and safety reasons, have become almost fortresses. Parents are cut out, not just left out, they're cut out. We've got to reach back to the parents, reach back into the homes, uh, and, and re-win the trust, if you will, of parents and families in this. Parents and children, it's not schools. How do we ensure that children have access to the best education, Mr. Brubaker? Well, your original question was, do I support federal tax credits? for parents to make their own choices in education? Yes, I do. Anything that puts parents in the driver's seat and takes government out of it, it will improve education. When it comes to school choice, I proved I can approach those problems. I passed the virtual school bill, which established the first virtual schools in Alabama. I put homeschool protections into law. And if the federal government really wants to help education, all that billions of dollars that we're spending on the U.S. Department of Education bureaucracy, let's abolish that Department of Government and block grant that money back to the states, and then you'll see education improve. Ms. Dobson, would you support a federal tax for alternative education expenses? I absolutely would. Every child is entitled to the best education to equip them to succeed, and parents are the ones who should determine where that education takes place. You know, for too long now, um, parents haven't had choices, especially here in District 2. We've got urban areas, suburban areas, and very rural areas, and I commend the state legislature, Governor Ivey, with the CHOOSE Act in taking an affirmative step to allow parents to have more options. Why do parents want more options? Because these days, you may be learning critical race theory in schools. You may have boys' and girls' bathrooms in schools. Parents need more options, and I would absolutely support national school choice to enable them to have a, a more active role in determining how and where their children can succeed. Thank you. Our next question, and please hold your applause. We're trying to get through as many questions as possible, and we ask you to please hold your applause. Farming is the next question. As we all know, agriculture is the number one industry in Alabama, and much of it goes on right here in District 2. Our next question will address first to Hampton Harris. Mr. Harris, we know that some farmers have difficulty finding workers. What other ways could you go about supporting Alabama farmers, helping them to increase their productivity while you're in Washington? Well, next to our military, our agricultural producers and farmers are our nation's most important people because they produce our food. And without them, we'd be reliant on other countries for food. And those who control the nation's food control the nation's people. And so we must protect our farmers here at home. And farmers are struggling right now because of the increased fuel prices, which goes into tractors and fertilizers, and is 
price has been going way up due to conflict in foreign places due to Biden's administration and the killing of the Keystone Pipeline. We need to drill here at home with American companies so we can get the price of fuel back down, which will tremendously help our farmers. Further, our, uh, up in Congress, they're trying to pass a new farm bill, but it's being kicked down the road. Our farmers need help with the farm bill to get passed with upgraded and updated information. And we need to make sure to put our farmers first because they are who feed us and who keep us um, full. Thank you. Candidate Belinda Thomas is next to answer this question. Again, please hold your applause. Candidate Belinda Thomas is next to answer this question. How would you go about supporting farmers and the agriculture industry here in District 2? Well, that's a great question, seeing that I am a farmer, and I am the only farmer in this race. <laughs> so you, this is, this is my lane here. <laughs> um, we're going to start with the first part. It is very difficult being a farmer. Our resources are very hard to get. The information with the resources um, is very hard to get. Uh, with me being the, uh, I am the founder of a nonprofit that helps women, uh, veterans, the social disadvantaged become new and beginning farmers because farmers becoming a dying art because of how the government has not supported the farmers and I want to keep that alive. I'm also the founder of a company called Alabamboo Inc. that helps with growing bamboo for farmers and investors building agriculture in, uh, opportunities in Alabama. So farming is the heart of Alabama, and we need me more resources, we need more support. It is very, very difficult, very hard for farmers, and I want to advocate for those farmers. All right, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thomas, <clears throat> Mr. Albritton, what would you do to support farmers and help them increase their productivity? One thing that uh, we experienced this past year, last few months is a drought that uh, has done significant damage to many people and farmers in District 2, uh, which I think illustrates the importance that what I would love to see is a greater improvement on irrigation. We have very little of that. We have so much water in Alabama and yet we don't use it for this. If we were to increase and provide a means, like in western states and others, the feds have helped and provided that source. We are not even trying to take a look and develop that. That's one thing that we need to develop here in District 2, significantly so, is improve and, and employ irrigation. That would have helped with the drought, that would help in production levels at all across corn, cotton, and peanuts. It would all help with that. Uh, that's one thing. Of course, everyone's right. We need to look and get the farm bill done so that we can make sure that we help the farmers and have that safety net for the troubles that they've had. Farming is our life lifeblood. We need to improve it completely. Expand it. Candidate Dick Brubaker is our next uh, to answer this question about the agriculture industry. How would you go about supporting farmers if elected to Congress? Well, I think the first thing a congressman can do is to stop federal policies that actually that directly impact farmers in a negative way. And on top of everyone's agenda should be the Biden's administration war on fossil fuels. The reason inflation is so high in the food sector is because our federal government has artificially inflated the price of gasoline and diesel. That directly hurts farmers and it raises costs not only for uh, them to transport their crops, but on all their other inputs. The other thing is we need a clean farm bill that just deals with reference prices for crops, not funding for Ukraine or, or whatever pet project other legislators have. We need a clean farm bill that just addresses the needs of farmers. And the last one is we need to protect American farm land. One of the threats to American agriculture is the fact that the Chinese and other foreign nationals are buying up large tracts of American productive farmland. That is a threat to our national security, and Congress needs to put a stop to it. Now, if we don't remind you to hold your applause, then <laughs> Mark and I are going to get in trouble. <laughs> so again, another reminder, no pictures, no videos, <laughs> no clapping. We'll stay on time. Ms. Dobson, your turn. What would you do to help farmers increase their productivity? Yes, this is very near and dear to my heart because my family's actively involved in ag production. I'm a fifth generation farmer. 
Uh, several things. Uh, I think the question originally dealt with uh, workforce availability. We have to streamline the H-2A and H-2B programs. Uh, these are migrants who do want to come over here for the right reasons, but right now there's too much bureaucratic red tape and we're forced to pay them twice the minimum wage. We have to be energy independent so the cost of our fertilizer and diesel goes down. We need a farm bill that's a farm bill and not a food stamp bill. Right now the current farm bill is over 80 percent addressing food stamps instead of the folks who actually make and produce our food products. We also have to finally kill the death tax. In the next two generations, over 40 percent of American farms are going to change hands, and we've got to address ways in which we can facilitate that intergenerational transfer. And finally, we need to protect farmlands from foreign investment. I'm so proud of Senator Tuberville and Senator Britt, who have co-sponsored the Farm Act in the Senate, and I, I would co-sponsor similar legislation in the House. Mrs. Carla DePriest, you will have the last word on this topic, how the federal government can support Alabama's farmers. Do I get two minutes? You get Here 60 seconds. Here in Alabama, we have some great industries from the seafood in the Gulf Coast, the aerospace in the north, and seafood in the south. Of course, the agriculture in our heartland needs up-to-date funding, training, and technologies so that the farmers have access to the best seas, and of course, as has been mentioned, uh, ag uh, irrigation, and these are things that the farmers need to be successful because coming from a, a business of catering, I see the high cost of food when I go to buy food that I have to pass on to my customers and they're not happy about it. We see it with the big corporations like McDonald's charging us more prices and then downsizing the quantity. Well, that comes from the food and from the agricultural uh, community. But I also like to say that I come from a family of loggers. My father was a logger in Freemanville, Alabama, going back, so, and my husband and I uh, have chickens. <laughs> All right, and on that note, we have a short break coming your way. Right, we're only just getting started, so please stay with us. More questions and answers when we come back. Welcome back to our special election forum. Whether you're watching on WSFA 12 News or on Fox 10, we appreciate your being here with us. It has been a pleasure bringing this forum to you today, and we will continue now with our questions so you can hear directly from the candidates wanting to represent District 2. Mrs. Thomas, we'll start this next round of questions with you. Inflation and government spending, they are hot topics right now. If you were elected to Congress, how would you rein in government spending, and how would you help citizens deal with the increased costs of living these days? Well, first of all, we need an overhaul of our, of our spending. Uh, we need to balance our budget, get our debt under control. And the way I would do that is look at the best concise plans and make sure that the votes are aligned to do what's best for our country because our debt ceiling is out the roof and we need a strong house to support our president-elect so that we can get our spending and our debt under control. Thank you. Candidate Greg Albritton will be next to address the issues of inflation and government spending. That's a fun topic. Government <laughs> spending equals inflation. The reason we have inflation is because we're printing money, money at, at uh, unheard of levels. Uh, we, we are 34 marching quickly toward $35 trillion in debt, and we wonder why we have inflation. Alabama has done things differently. Alabama pay, is paying its debt soft. We're not running deficits like the Fed. Alabama has, has surpluses rather than overspending. Alabama's doing it right. We need to get some of what we're doing here in Alabama up to Washington. We know how to fix this. We know how it can be resolved. It takes a while. It takes dedication. It takes discipline. And we've done that in Alabama. That's one of the major things I want to do when I get to Washington, is curb this spending to put it back into place so that we can do it properly, correctly, and balance our budgets. We can do it. We just need the folks up there to get it done. 
Mr. Brubaker, your time now to answer this question. We are talking about reining in government spending and helping people deal with the increased costs of living. Well, the first way you rein in government spending is get the federal government out of areas it has no business being in in the first place. Education would be one. And the second thing is we cannot Im illegal, this illegal immigration affects everything. Look at the money the federal government is spending on supporting millions of people in our country who shouldn't be here in the first place. It would have been a lot cheaper to send them home than to support them in hotels and give them credit cards at taxpayer expense. We need to go back to the old Republican idea of, a lim of reducing federal bureaucracy and taking that money and block grain it to the states where you're not losing 30 cents on every dollar to fund the bureaucracy that's supposed to manage the money. We, can, we have 8 million adult men in this country that aren't working at all because the federal government is paying them not to. All that's got to stop. And until you do stop it, you will never rein in inflation. Caroline Dobson, inflation and government spending, your thoughts? Yes, well, I'm running to fight for Alabama families, and this inflation is killing our families here in District 2. We've got to cut taxes. We've got to deregulate. We've got to stop paying people not to work. We have got to shut our border and send everyone home. We've also got to become energy independent. We were there under Trump. We've got to get back to it. In just three years, the basic cost of monthly expenses for a family of four like mine has gone up $950 a month with no end in sight, $34 trillion in debt. It's not just that it will cost less to produce goods and ship goods when we're energy independent. It's that when we are not energy independent, we are actively funding bad actors like Venezuela, like nations in the Middle East. So it's a matter of security and also economy that we become energy independent again, and that will help tremendously curb the effects of inflation. Mr. Priest, when it comes to government spending, how are you going to rein that in, and how are you going to help with inflation and the increased cost of living? Our campaigning, I've talked to single mothers struggling to make ends meet, senior citizens on fixed incomes that this economy is not working for. First, we need to throw back all of the current Democratic overspending, veto any of their tax hikes, and then there's the war on energy that had been previously stated that we need to unleash all the high paying jobs here in the United States that will fuel job growth and lower our utility bills. And stop, stop, stop all the disastrous socialism that suppresses job growth. Thank you, ma'am. All right, Mr. Harris, as one of our candidates pointed out, inflation and government spending could be seen as tied. How would you address both topics? Well, inflation under this administration is unbelievable. We are, being an economics major, it blows my mind how our p leaders are running this country and how they don't know what we're going to drive ourselves into the ground. The rampant printing of money, sending money overseas without any accountability, and giving out free money, and wanting to forgive student loan debt even coming up, you don't see people wanting to forgive trade school debt because those people actually get in the workforce and work for their living. So we need to make sure that we are able to lower the budget and we can do that as well by removing power out of DC and giving that power back to the people and to the states because our federal government has way too much power and way too many agencies that our founding fathers did not intend for our nation to have under the federal government. So we need to decrease spending and be able to lower inflation by getting back under the budget. And finally, to you, Mrs. Thomas, your answer to this question. Well, I have to agree that we do need to take control of our budget and we do need to, um, our states need to have control and the government need not to dictate how we um, use our resources. Um, we do spend too much of our monies on bills and issues that does not help our economy. Um, again, with the immigration going on, all of the money spent to house, to feed, that money could be taking care of our citizens. 
It's taking away from our schools. Um, it's increasing our prison system, which, which drive our costs up. Um, it puts a big impact on the workers and our tax dollars. So we really need to take control of our own spending. Thank you. And now we're on to the next question. The U.S. Constitution says candidates don't need to live in a congressional district in order to run for a U.S. Congress seat. Some candidates in District 2 don't live in the newly redrawn district. So, Ms. Thomas, back to you. Do you feel candidates should live in the district? And if elected, how would you effectively connect and engage with your constituents? I do feel like we should live in the district so that we can connect and can engage and know what the needs are and know what the problems are and be out in the community and be made aware. I'm very familiar with the area because I'm a property owner. I've lived. I know the lack thereof. Um, I had my children in one of those school areas and it was very depleted and so it caused me to have to leave because of what was going on in those, in those districts. So um, we do need to be a part so that we can be aware and be more effective for the people of the district that we're representing. Thank you. Mr. Albritton, do you believe candidates should live in the district where they're running? And if elected, how would you effectively connect and engage with your constituents here in District 2? Whether I believe it should be or shouldn't be, it's a matter of what the law is. And the law is what it is. You have to live within the state to be able to run for that state in the district. Uh, part of the reason for that, I think, I don't know, I wasn't around when that happened, was that we have um, the district lines change. So I think the key question is that whoever represents this area has to know this area. I think the key is that when someone represents the people, they've got to know the people. And as I illustrated in my opening, uh, for the last 30 some odd years, I've been working and living and traveling these roads. I know what the roads are. I know where they are. I know the, how so deficient an infrastructure this district is. We have roads that are half paved, whether it be 84, 48, and all, all along the line, we have them that are partially complete. We need someone that's familiar with this area, and that would be me. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker, how do you feel about candidates living in the district they represent, and if elected, how would you connect and engage with your constituents? Well, one of the reasons I think people should elect me to Congress is, you know, when I graduated from college, I moved back to this district, to Montgomery. I did two things right off the bat. I got a job teaching school so I could pay my rent. And the other thing I did was join the National Guard. Since that time, I've run a business here, raised five boys here, uh, and represented this district in the state legislature. I believe I am familiar with what people need and what people want out of an elected official. Uh, one of the things that I think they want are people who will term limit themselves and people that will agree not to become lobbyists when they leave Congress. Uh, but as far as changing the current law, I think we are, we are safe to leave that up to the voters. Mrs. Dobson, on the issue of living in the district you represent and on the topic of engaging effectively with your constituents. Yes, well, again, that's certainly been a topic in this race because there are folks in the Republican primary and in the Democrat that are running and do not live in the district, but it is not a legal requirement, and I think it's, it'll be up to the voters to decide um, to see how, how these folks plan on spending time in Washington and at their homes outside the district and also spending enough time in the district to know what's going on, to know how policies are impacting the voters. I'm so proud to have been born and raised in this district, to be raising my children in this district. And you know, I think the House of Representatives was really designed to be your local voice in our nation's capital. Originally, senators were le elected by the state legislature, but your local representative was intended to be your voice and to stand for you. And so I think the voters will choose someone like me who chooses to be here, who grew up here, who cares about the people of District 2 and who is running to fight for Alabama families here in District 2. Mr. Priest, should candidates live in District 2 if they're running to represent District 2? 
As a former district manager for a congressman, that was a part of my responsibility, was traveling throughout the district, setting up speaking tours, listening to the constituents, seeing what their concerns were. And of course, that made a difference that you lived in that community so that when you see people on the street, they may just come up to you and say that I have issue with Social Security or the VA or whatever. But back to your question, I'd say to you, taxation without representation. I agree that you should live in the district that you're representing. Of course, you can have someone from outside of the district to come and represent you, and they might be even do a good job, but it's better to be a part of that community. And I know that being a part of that community, as I stated initially, is that you get to see the hardships that the people encounter when you come from that community, when you have families and relatives that live in that community. Business development is essential to helping out the second district. Thank you. Mr. Harris, is it important that a candidate in District 2 live in District 2? And how would you effectively connect with constituents if you were elected? Well, I grew up right in Montgomery in the district, and my roots are here, my family's here. I own a business in the district and run, run a business out of the district. And so I am intimately aware of what the needs of this district is and what the people need. And I think it is important for someone to know what that district needs so they are able to represent it up in federal Congress and on federal laws and be a good representation of what the people of Alabama District 2 want and their issues on federal election and a federal issue. So I know I have the knowledge of what this district needs. I have the roots and I'm, my business is here and I can very accurately and uh, diligently represent this district. All right, so moving on now to question number seven. And we'll uh, go back to you, Mr. Albritton, for, to answer this question. How has your past experience in life prepared you to uh, represent this district in, in Washington? It's been one of service. Um, as I mentioned, I've, I've spent my life in, in service in many ways, whether it be the military, uh, my law practice, um, um, my church, I, I believe in service. Uh, I think I've done some good work in regards to that in representing my district. Uh, we, we've gotten roads paved in Monroe, Conecuh, uh, Clark, uh, Washington. In Washington, that was a road that going down to Fruitdale High School hadn't had new asphalt in 20, since 1929. Um, we've making great strides economically in the area. Mobile is becoming a world-renowned port because of the infrastructure we're putting in there. I've been a part of that. Uh, my, I won't need training wheels when I go to Washington. I know how to do this. I know what the problems are. I know how to get things done. And like Dick, I agree, problem solving is an important factor. I think I can do this pretty well. Thank you. Mr. Brubaker, how has your past experience prepared you for this job? Well, first, growing up here, raising my family here, running a business here, but I think everybody up here would agree with me that the main thing in my past that prepares me to be a good uh, congressman is the fact that is my Christian faith. My parents, uh, through the grace of God, taught me good values, taught me to keep my promises, taught me to care about other people. Um, one of the most important things in my life experience is raising a disabled son. I have great sympathy for people who are having trouble getting health care and, and getting what their family needs. And finally, I have proven as a legislator, I have a conservative record. You can go look at it. When problems come up, I prove that I can write a bill and solve them. And, and most of that legislation had to do with reining government in, not trying to make it bigger. Uh, but I think mainly uh, the experience you get from going to church and raising a family, living in a community, and running a business, that's what counts. Mrs. Dobson, your turn. Your reflections about your past life experiences and how they prepare you for representing District 2 in Washington. Well, well first and foremost, uh, I'm a Christian, I'm a mom, I'm a wife, daughter. I, I am a lawyer. I understand how laws are drafted and made. But, but most importantly, I, I grew up on a farm uh, where I learned the value of hard work and the fact that the job is never done. 
And, and I was raised to know that, that everything that we, we have really belongs to God. And he has given us the privilege and the responsibility of, of taking care of it, of making it more fruitful, and of leaving it better than we found it for the next generation. And, and we need more attitudes of faithful stewardship in Washington, D.C. We've got too many career politicians who are trying to satisfy their special interest groups or, or owe favors to certain parties. We need more people to stand for conservative values and fight for what is right in Washington. And I am the best candidate to win this race in November and to represent you in Washington, D.C. Ms. Priest, we're talking about your past experience and how that enables you to do this job. I do believe that experience matters and I will serve this community. My background in accounting, insurance, as a small business owner, in the political part, I've been the appointed absentee ballot manager for Mobile County, taking care of elections, working with people. And even though elections is something that is crucial, that we have the gold standard here in the state of Alabama. So I do believe that familiar, being familiar with any system will reduce the learning curve. And as I've stated numerous times, that I have worked in Washington, D.C and in the district, and I have that experience that I will take there and I will fight for the people, for your children. And one final quote, success is not brilliance, yet relationships, resilience, and resources to be effective. And I believe, believe that I will be the effective Congresswoman for District 2. Thank you, and now to you, Mr. Harris. Your life experiences and how they prepare you for this role. So I grew up right here in the district, like I said, and I was homeschooled along with my six other siblings. And my mother instilled in us Christian conservative values and that are still the backbone of my everyday life. And I stayed true to my roots and attended a local college right here in Montgomery, Auburn University of Montgomery, got a degree in economics and worked at Baptist Hospital during that time in the emergency room, where I was able to see the healthcare uh, options that are poor in this district, as well as the opioid epidemic due to our open borders. I then went to one of the most conservative law schools in the nation right here in the state of Alabama and received a law degree. And most recently, I opened up my own real estate brokerage right here in Montgomery and I'm a practicing attorney. And I've done all of this by the age of 27. I'm young, passionate, energetic, and I can get things done. And I am not myself part of the establishment or career politics, nor is my family. I got where I'm at through hard work, determination, getting my hands dirty, and that's exactly what I would do for this district in Washington. And finally to you, Mrs. Thomas, your reflections on your experience and what qualifies you for this position. Well, my first qualification is I became a wife, a mother, a victim, and a victor. Um, after losing my husband, I had to stand strong. We were, I was a business owner and still currently a business owner. I'm in the process right today of being of service my background in nursing, being a farmer, feeding people, also having the nonprofit of helping build farmers, um, preparing today right for an event tomorrow with my guest speaker, Dr. Elvita King, helping me in my fight to build uh, farming to be of service, um, being city council elect, uh, being a representative, being the representative of change, um, I'm not a career politician, but I'm determined, I'm victorious, I'm willing, and I'm able. I am the best candidate for this race. Thank you. On to our next question. It is safe to say everyone on this panel supports our nation's military, but the military is struggling when it comes to recruiting more people to join. The military is very important to District 2. So you first, Mr. Brubaker, what can we do to make sure that the recruitment is there so that we are making sure that the United States has the best fighting force in the world? That is, a, that is an important question. Uh, I was born in Harlingen, Texas, when my father was serving as an Air Force officer. 
Uh, I was joined the National Guard. My son is an active duty of the 75th Ranger Regiment. He's been deployed to Afghanistan three different times. So when I talk about military readiness, uh, which is what recruitment is, uh, I, it's very important to me. The Army particularly is having a hard time recruiting right now because of two reasons. Number one, the benefits that the government used to offer to people to enlist in the Army, they're now giving to illegal immigrants for nothing. We need to go back to offering recruits real incentives that you can't get elsewhere. Uh, and the other thing we need to do is turn the military back into training soldiers and not trying to social engineer their consciousness. That is not the sort of thing that attracts people, and that is why the Army is having such a hard time. And the last thing is we've got to get serious about taking care of our veterans. Any veteran I've talked to has told me about the horrible difficulties they're having with benefits that they're owed. Thank you. Caroline Dobson, how do we improve military recruiting and how do we ensure that our military is the best fighting force in the world? We are at um, a, a sad point because um, globally it looks a lot like it did on the eve of World War II and we have about the same number of troops now as we did then even though our population is more than doubled. I, I want to thank Senator Albritton for his service um, and, and uh, Mr. Brubaker for your son's service. We don't do enough to appreciate our military. First, we've got to reestablish trust. Uh, part of that is, is due to the fact that we have a commander in chief who's not fit to stand trial. We have a secretary of defense who went AWOL. In 2024, so far, we've lost 10 service members. In order to recruit, we have got to give young men and women confidence in their leadership. Secondly, we've got to give them clear and simple rules of engagement and stop Monday morning quarterbacking what they've been doing trying to keep our community safe. And finally, we've got to give them the equipment that they need to keep up with our enemies. Here in District 2, we've got Lockheed Martin, Austell, Airbus. We hold the keys in District 2 to ensuring that we can have a strong military again. Mr. Priest, how do we make sure that our military stays the best? I come from a background of family members that are committed to the military. And of course, as I've told you numerous times, that my husband and I live with my son, James Dupriest, 36, that is a disabled veteran and that we live daily with the challenges of his mental illness, not being equipped, even being educated ourselves to help him deal with the trauma that our military people endure. Our freedom is not free. You, you, and you, you sit here because we have those young men and women that we sent out to fight and to maintain our freedom. With that in mind, we need to make sure that the military is updated with the most current technology, the most current uh, training. My husband and I, with our catering business, we feed the, dis, uh, the military people out at Fort Whiting, and we see those guys in their uniforms and the pride that they have in serving this country, but then they leave their families behind, and with that in mind, they tell us of their struggles, and so they need a raise also. Mr. Harris, how do we ensure that our military is the best around the world, and how do we recruit more people to serve? Well, as the husband of an active duty Air Force officer, she's an attorney for the Air Force, and the grandson of both a Vietnam veteran and uh, a grandfather who's in the Air Force for over 20 years, our military is very important to me. I see how our veterans struggle getting care, and that is a very much decentivizes wanting to get in the military because of how poorly our veterans are treated outside and how long they have to wait for housing or can't get housing or getting health care. So we must take care of our veterans. We must also stop letting the left politicize our military through woke trainings and vaccine mandates and focus more on protecting our country and making sure our country is ready to fight at all times. Uh, and we must make sure that our active duty service members are respected and are not being completely taken down with woke ideologies being pushed on our military from the left. Mrs. Thomas, your ideas about military, the, our, our nation's military and recruitment. Well, as the granddaughter of a service member, as the grandmother of a service, as the mother-in-law of a military vet, um, the military is very important to me, and also having my 
um, godfather who, uh, Vietnam Marine here, seeing the struggles that I have had to help him with just to get services uh, that he didn't even know he was aware of or that it was available to him. So we need to bring the sense of respect, pride, and honor back to the military and give them the support and give them the dignity of being known that they are proud Americans to serve and protect our borders. Um, we need to consider uh, bills and budgets to back the military and, 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 and show that this is honorable to our young people looking for, for the future. When they look and see how we take care of our vets, they don't want to give their life and not be respected. So that's what I feel like we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Albritton, thank you for your service. And when it comes to the military, from recruitment to might, how do we keep it strong? First off, uh, I agree with all these folks, fine folks, that uh, recognize and, and understand all, all the points you've made are all valid and good. Standing up for our veterans, making sure we have that, making sure that we have the means to do what we need to. The difficulty I find that I see, that I've experienced, is that very often the people wearing the uniform uh, are too anxious to get out of it because the pride is gone. They have very little faith in sometimes their leadership, sometimes in the equipment, sometimes in, in the assignment. That comes to a responsibility from the top down as to making it important that what you're doing is correct and right, giving you the proper equipment to do it with and making sure your orders and our assignments are valid, good, and clear and able to perform. Thank you, sir. Our next question is about Social Security, and we'll start with you, Ms. Dobson, for this question. Uh, many people, especially younger people, are concerned about the viability of Social Security. They fear that they are paying into a system that might not be there when they retire. Do you share these concerns, and if so, what should be done to shore up Social Security? Yes, well, well, I'm, I'm fighting for Alabama families, and that means people of all ages. Um, for those that are currently on Social Security or, or about to begin Social Security, I don't think that we, we should touch that. These people have worked hard their whole lives, they've paid taxes, and they have relied on uh, the fact that the Social Security is going to be there for them. For folks my age and younger, uh, we've got to come to the table and stop playing politics. We've got to come up with a workable so solution. You know, we cannot keep uh, growing um, our national debt. We can't keep kicking the can down the road for our children. And we have to, to face the facts that the money may not be there for us. So we need, both parties need to come together and come up with a different plan uh, so that we can, can cut spending but also provide for people in their elderly years. Mr. Priest, how would you address these concerns about Social Security paying into a system that may or may not be there? There's approximately 71 million people struggling to survive on Social Security. What do you say to the senior citizens that are having to go back and live with their children? And if any of you want to do that, raise your hand. People pay into the trust fund to hope that that trust fund is still there for them when they retire. And our government has done a horrible job of taking money out of the trust fund whenever they need it for any of their pet projects. So what I would recommend is that we also develop, we have all these brilliant people that work uh, in a lot of financial institutions, that they come up with some creative ideas to put money back into the trust fund for the people that are relying on their Social Security. Mr. Harris, you mentioned your age earlier. You're the youngest candidate on the stage today. What are your thoughts about the future of Social Security? Well, at the rate we're spending money in this country and the inflation, whatever is left in Social Security is not going to be worth anything. We have to fix inflation. It's out of control. Even if you're paying into a retirement account, but you're taking out loans faster than that's going to cover, 
you're not going to have enough to pay the loans, let enough have a retirement. So we must cut spending. And to do this, we need to take power and get rid of the key agencies in D.C. and bring that power back to the states and more importantly back to the people because our federal government has way too much power and is spending way too much money on things that was not, were not intended for our federal government to be handling. And if we can cut our spending, we will be able to make sure we have enough money in there to cover what was promised and what everyone has been paying into for their entire lives for their social security and they can get the money that they were promised and it's not thrown away. Belinda Thomas, many younger people are concerned about the viability of social security and the future. They fear they're paying into a system that won't be there for them when they retire. What are your thoughts? I feel like we should protect the social security and protect the uh, people that's paying into social security and um, being a part of Congress come up with flexibilities to make sure that their money will be there when, when it's time. Uh, social security was never intended to be a retirement plan. So the ones that have paid into it need to know that it's there for them. And they also need to know that they have the options of being a part of independent retirement um, programs, but that their social security is there for them. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Albritton, your turn to answer their question. What are we going to do about social security? Uh, we've got to do something. Uh, uh, and I'll take, I thought I was doing this guy on the stage. Anyway, uh, look, Social Security is, is a relatively simple answer. Uh, it's a taxation that is taxed and then almost immediately paid out to recipients. Uh, there's no holding, there's no advancement, there's no investment, nothing. It is simply taking from some and sending to others. Uh, that's a faulty system to begin with. And I understand the concerns of uh, those that, that are paying in as to whether something will be there. Their money won't be there. Their money will be gone. They're going to be relying on others to pay the taxes. We need to change that system up in a way. And I know you can't change this uh, a draconian way. It can't be changed right away. But we've got to start making steps to bring this in. Not just a, a better system on the government side, but also you got to pro provide a means for private industry and investments to come into play. That's how you get this accomplished. It can be done. Candidate Dick Brubaker, Social Security, its viability going forward. Well, it's not viable going forward, which is, I think is the reason for your question. Uh, and I, I agree with Mrs. Dobson for the people that are receiving Social Security benefits now. That is an absolute obligation of the United States Treasury. And whatever it costs other programs, those obligations are going to have to be met. And I think we're way past, past even talking about, especially for younger workers, uh, trying to keep Social Security in the form it is now. We're going to have to, whether it's individual retirement accounts or letting people manage their own money, uh, the current system was set up based on certain demographic expectations. And as the United States birth rate has fallen through just pe choices people make, and frankly for abortion has one of the biggest reasons we're in this mess, uh, the system cannot survive the way it's set up currently. And the chickens have come home to roost and Congress is going to have to deal with it. All right, thank you. <clears throat> we have time now for one more question and a reminder that you will get 60 seconds for this question. And it has to do with Ukraine. A financially supporting Ukraine has received mixed reaction from members of Congress. Where do you stand on the issue of financially supporting Ukraine as well as supporting our ally, Israel? And Mr. Albritton, we'll start in alphabetical order with you first. Oh, I get it this one order? <laughs> I would much rather, if there's going to be a war, which I would prefer not to have one, but if there's going to be one, I would rather it be fought somewhere other than here. Uh, having said that, uh, we need to make sure that we're using our monies and resources properly and appropriately. Now, what we have currently, two wars going on, both of them are feeding out of the same arsenal, ours. And ours is not prepared for that. 
our industrial base is not built for it. We're not replenishing, and we're just using it up. We've got to put some good sense on this and make sure that if we're going to do this, which maybe we should, but we've got to have that argument, we've got to have that discussion. But if we're going to do it, we've got to gear up for it and make sure that we can do it so that we don't drain the arsenals dry because we may have another one someplace else. Uh, we, we are in uh, dire circumstances and threats, and we're not planning for it. We're essentially talking about defending democracy abroad. So, Mr. Brubaker, would you support financially supporting Ukraine and Israel? Well, if I've got to choose between Ukraine and Israel, I choose Israel. Uh, I certainly don't support uh, funding the Ukraine war in the manner in that it's been funded so far. Uh, Greg is absolutely right. If we're going to fight a war with the Russians, I'd rather oh, fight God. it there than here. But let's face it, uh, a, gr a great deal of the, of the U.S. taxpayer dollars that have gone to Ukraine are not accounted for. We still don't know where that money is. As we move forward, I think two things are important. Number one, Israel first. Number two, any money given to Ukraine should be given in the form of credits, where they can buy U.S. military supplies and, and buy from our manufacturers, Raytheon and companies like that, but not given cash, which seems to have a mysterious habit of slipping away from them. And finally, the U.S. so far has gotten a pretty good deal on the Ukraine war. I mean, we have degraded the Russian military, but that doesn't mean that it's a war we should ever commit U.S. troops to. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Dobson, financially supporting Ukraine has received mixed reactions. Where do you stand on supporting Ukraine and also our ally Israel? Yes, well, these are, these are two different places and two totally different issues. When it comes to Israel, we should unequivocally support Israel. We are their top ally. And that means not just giving them aid, but it means untying their hands, trusting that they are going to eradicate Hamas and do so with compassion. Uh, and when it comes to funding sources, we should defund the UN Relief and Works Agency um, in Gaza that was providing electricity and, and had individuals involved in the Hamas attack give that money to Israel. When it comes to Ukraine, while Putin is a bad actor and, and my heart hurts for a lot of the Ukrainians that have suffered, we're in this situation because of Biden. You know, he authorized the Nord Stream 2 pipeline that allowed Russia to circumvent Ukraine and enabled them to invade Ukraine. So before we send another taxpayer dollar to Ukraine, we have got to secure our own border. And if we do send any further money to Ukraine, there should be a system of accountability and Ukraine should share with us a strategic resolution that's realistic to that conflict. Defending democracy abroad in Ukraine and financially supporting that country's war against the Russian invasion. Also, the question of supporting our ally Israel. We go next to Ms. Carla Dupriest. We, as the United States, need to stand with our partners around the world. And yes, we need to fund Ukraine and Israel and we also need to provide additional funding for our defense. But nobody is talking about China. China, they are committing cyber attacks on the United States and other countries around the world. And they're doing that to lower our defenses so that we are not paying attention to what they're doing. And they're doing that so that uh, we can be fighting each other and then they're attacking Ukraine and then they're attacking Israel. So we need to be aware of what's going on and address that issue. And somebody needs to talk about that. And funding Israel and funding Ukraine are fundamental to our freedoms. Because if they attack our infrastructure, our water, our communications, then they can do anything to us as a country. And we don't know how many people that they've sent over here through the border. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Harris, your turn to respond now. What are your thoughts on financially supporting Ukraine and also making sure that we protect our ally Israel? So first off, we must support Israel. The Bible unequivocally states those who bless Israel will be blessed and those who curse Israel will be cursed. Ukraine, we've sent enough money over there already. I think we could have purchased that nation. 
and we have not held our money accountable. We have no idea where a lot of that money is going, and we don't even know if it's falling into the wrong hands or even into Russian hands. We must have accountability, and we must also be sure to take care of ourselves at home. Because like in an airplane, when the oxygen mask falls, you must take care of yourself first in order to help others. If you are suffocating, you cannot help other nations. And so we need to make sure we put America first before funding other conflicts across the world, such as Ukraine. Mrs. Thomas, you will have the last word this evening. We are talking about U.S. financial aid to both Ukraine and Israel. Save the, less for, the best for last. Uh, first of all, uh, Israel and Ukraine are two separate issues. And as far as what we've done for Ukraine, there is no accountability. And we do need to have accountability as to how we're spending our monies. Israel is our biggest ally, and they have, they have always been with the United States. Uh, their very existence is being threatened, and we should support Israel. Israel have a government. Israel gives accountability, and that is who we should really put uh, our backing behind um, because they give us accountability, and they have always uh, supported the United States. Thank you. Okay. Well, we have run out of time for this evening, but of course we want to thank all of our candidates for participating in this forum. Now we can give a collective round of applause. <laughs> And of course, we want to uh, thank our sponsors, the Alabama Republican and Democratic parties. And I would like to thank you, Mark, for the opportunity to do this. Thank you, uh, Lenise, for driving up to Montgomery, helping us out. Thanks to everyone at Fox 10 and all the people at WSFA 12 News who put on this event. I think it's been quite a productive conversation. Yes, we have learned more about our candidates wanting your vote for District 2, and hopefully with the information they provided today, you will be able to cast your ballot with confidence. Our thanks to all of you who watched at home. We appreciate your joining us as well. The deadline to register to vote in Alabama online is February 19th, and the primary election is March 5th. So mark your calendars and go vote. Thanks everybody for watching and have a good night.